uh, it's very hard to convey the depth of horror and pain that I, my family, and my country have experienced over the last few days. The last time so many Jews were killed in one day was the Holocaust. We are devastated. We are torn to pieces. I personally am torn to pieces. Um, and we are hearing more and more stories of uh, utter, utter deprivation carried out by Hamas against our, against children, against mothers, against grandmothers, soldiers, an entire base of women who worked in intelligence was mowed down. A bunch of 20 year old girls. My daughter was in a base just like that three years ago. And she said to me, mom, that could have been me. We were not prepared for be, having a physical attack. None of us were trained to shoot. We had nothing. So they were just sitting ducks because Israel never expected this kind of invasion. We have no strategic depths in Israel. When I would host Chinese uh, experts, uh, Chinese policy advisors, government officials, etc., in Israel, I would take them around the country and have them walk the, the, to the border and see, we have no strategic depths. The minute you cross our border, we are there. There's, there's no buffer zone. So Israel has worked religiously to keep the, the violence and the attacks on our country on the other side. And uh, this was a failure. This was a, um, a straight out failure. And we have gone from Saturday morning shock the entire day, just feeling like you're getting punched in the stomach over and over and over. And then we got past that first day. And now we're told we need to prepare our safe room for a potential attack by Hezbollah in the north with 150,000 missiles pointed at us. And these are, some of these are precision missiles and they will, you know, it's not a hole in the building like you might've seen in Tel Aviv or um, part of a house. This is a complete white map if it comes from the north. And in this case, uh, there's expectation that there will be hundreds of thousands of casualties. So we are preparing our safe room and we're told we have to put cash and, you know, you assume water and dry goods, that's what they said, but also cash and your ID. I mean, I guess so that your ID doesn't get destroyed. So afterwards, if you can walk out of there, we can know who you are or they'll know who you were when, when they pull you out of the, uh, I don't know. I, I really don't know. It's so hard to fathom. We're just not completely prepared. Um, although I won't, will, I do have to say we're not unprepared. I, I do, uh, um, remember that over the past few years, you know, sort of toward during COVID, we were reminded by the military that we need to do this kind of preparation. We will need to do it. And here the day has come. So where am I? I'm preparing the safe room. I'm trying to focus on work. I'm trying to help my kids who are all adults, but still suffering through this. And, uh, and, and they in turn, you know, are doing volunteer work, uh, to try to help anyone that they can in order to get through this in one piece and hopefully come out of it stronger and with a, a very new Middle East. So let's talk about, uh, the sort of, I guess, Chinese interpretation of, uh, the events over the weekend, which apparently are like America's fault. I'm curious for your sort of diagnosis of, um, you know, what were some sort of geostrategic drivers uh, of the attacks? Well, the Chinese interpretation, first of all, I've been in touch with scores of, uh, government and, and party, uh, policy advisors, experts, academics over the last few days and every single one of them on a one, one to one, one on one basis has offered heartfelt support, standing with Israel, supporting the, the people, et cetera. Uh, the government has interpreted this. Um, it comes across in a very similar way to uh, the way China has interpreted past 
terror attacks. And it is bizarre to say, but, you know, even we woke up and said, oh, this is another terror. Is it another terror attack? And, oh, no, this is not just another terror attack. I mean, can you believe those words that I'm saying? That terror attacks are, are our norm. Oh, yeah, it's just another terror attack. So um, China's response has always been uh, generally to take the Palestinian side. Um, politically, China officially stands 100% with the Palestinians and has done so, um, you know, for decades. Uh, on, a, on an economic level, China is very happy to work with Israel on a personal level, on a cultural level, uh, many interactions, academic cooperation, scientific cooperation, et cetera, et cetera. But politically, they've always been very clear. 100% anti-Israel votes in every international institution. Uh, when I wrote, when I said this on CGTN, I was criticized by a Chinese scholar that this was too harsh, that I was too sharp. And my response is, this is not the time for uh, concern about um, Israeli harshness and sharpness. This is a time where history will judge the decisions that are made by countries around the world. And we see, you know, Brussels generally is not a great supporter of Israel. It, it generally is a critic of Israel, but they firmly stand with Israel right now. The butchery that took place, no human, no humane person could watch that and say uh, that there, this is anything but barbaric and stand with the people who are suffering. Um, many Chinese people, I understand, uh, are getting a lot of misinformation and disinformation, which is common. Uh, but it means that the government and the censorship is allowing that uh, misinformation to become rampant on uh, uh, and Weibo and um, other social media, which is causing a, a misreading, and it's making it look like once again, the Palestinians are suffering from Israeli aggression. Well, this began with the most egregious and savage, barbaric behavior against citizens, civilians. And uh, the next step is very much um, that Israel is going to have to respond. And I ask the Chinese leadership, if a country near China, entered across the border and murdered an equal percentage of people and captured an e equal percentage of people, of Chinese, and took them into the, their territory as hostages, what would China do? China, we, we, we have seen China's response to any kind of modest, and I will say modest terror. There is terror and there is terror. Uh, you know, a, um, a car bomb in Tiananmen totally transformed China's approach. And um, what we've experienced, what Israel has experienced throughout the years has been horrific, but it doesn't compare to what we went through on, on uh, Saturday, which is Simchat Torah, it's a day of joy, the holiday happens to be my birthday, and Instead, this day will always be associated with a uh, tragedy and a tragedy of enormous uh, uh, proportions. So um, China's interpretation is very much seen through the lens, in, from what I can tell, of the standard uh, competition with the United States, the fear of U.S. strength and um, its ability to cultivate strong alliances. And uh, therefore, that uh, um, rhetoric is guiding the interpretation of what has happened here. And that is in itself tragic because it will lead China to um, miscalculations on policy steps in this region. The Middle East, we all know, has become very important to China. It has actually um, uh, 
uh, accurately identified the Middle East as sort of the weak link between uh, the, between Europe and the Indo-Pacific. China has focused very much on investment in the Middle East, bringing Middle East countries into its orbit. We know that four of the six countries that were brought into BRICS are Middle East countries, including Saudi Arabia and Iran, which is, I, I believe, part of um, the, the wind in Iran's sails, was becoming uh, more of a recognized uh, player on the international stage. I also think that the U.S. Uh, releasing at least $6 billion to Iran, which is fungible, even if that money is only for humanitarian aid, frees up a lot of other money for Iran to use to back Hamas. We know that Hamas made, had uh, many delegations visit Iran over the past many months, and it's clearly training, guidance, and masterminding of Iran behind this uh, attack. Hamas what uh was backed by Iran and guided by Iran and um when we look to who is uh at at the core of this it is uh a country that is working closely with China and China is aware of Iran's threats to eviscerate Israel and the first statement that Xi Jinping comes out with is to create the to in answer to this attack, a Palestinian state must be created alongside a Jewish state. And I want to ask, what, uh, what in, in this event on Saturday indicates that there is an interest in a Palestinian state alongside a Jewish state? There is nothing in that attack that would lead to a kind of compromise. And anybody who thinks that that was an effort for anything less than the entire territory of Israel is kidding themselves. The, first of all, Hamas does not represent the Palestinian people or the Palestinian Authority. Hamas has been running its own territory for years. There was no reason for them to be interested in Israel at all. But their goal and their charter states they will take the entire land and turn it into an Islamic state. And that is what the murderous efforts that took place on Saturday are meant to lead to, toward. Iran has orchestrated a multi-level, multifaceted plan where it starts with Hamas, draws Israel on foot into uh, Gaza, and at that point, there's an agreement that Hezbollah will begin to attack from the north. While we have many of our um, military uh, uh, capabilities focused on on the west in Gaza. In that at that time, there are also uh, Iranian militias made up of Taliban and Houthis in Iraq and Syria who can infiltrate from the north. They can then open up two more fronts which is the Palestinians in uh, Judea and Samaria, which some people refer to as the West Bank. And the final uh, front are Israeli Arabs. And we saw some of that uh, take place in the past, in the recent past. Um, but in the end, this um, uh, four or five point attack is not about convincing Israel to make concessions. If Israel thought that concessions would lead to a peace and uh, a um, live and let live situation. We would have done it years ago. Uh, Ehud Barak offered Arafat with the support of Clinton more than 100% of the territory that has been discussed in these two state solutions for decades. And he said, no, flat out, no. He said, I will not be the the Arab leader who gives away our sacred land. Well, what sacred land is he talking about if he was already getting 100% of the territory discussed? Let's take a step back and talk a little bit about the sort of China's moves in the Middle East over the past year or two. You've, you've seen a lot of coverage of um, them sort of husbanding this rapprochement between Iran and, and Saudi, Arabia, Saudi Arabia, which looks a little interesting in retrospect. But I'm... Uh, I'm curious sort of what you think the, the, the broader motivation was for all of that and where 
China will stand, uh, you know, when the dust starts to settle on whatever is going to happen over the next few months. So first of all, the, we have to keep in mind what we said at the outset or what you noted so rightly that it looks like it's about all about America from the perspective of China. So as I noted, the Middle East is this weak link. Uh, China has been in the largest investor in the Middle East since uh, 2016. The digital Silk Road has been very successful here. Uh, the investment um, uh, by China into Middle East countries that can provide um, payment through oil, et cetera, uh, has grown exponentially. exponentially. The lar I think the third largest BRI uh, investment country um, a couple of years ago was Iraq because they can pay for whatever they need in oil. Um, we know that there's a huge amount of Chinese technology. Huawei is, is, has blanketed most of the Middle East except Israel. They don't have the same, the, the uh, Arab countries don't have the same security concerns that Israel has uh, with respect to privacy, with respect to control over their telecoms. For us, it's existential. For the Arabs, it's just another thing. So um, they also believe that they can balance the two, uh, the balance the U.S. off of China and vice versa. Uh, we've seen very clearly Saudi Arabia and UAE's ability to um, get benefits from both sides, and especially Saudi Arabia playing one off the other uh, quite successfully uh, because Saudi Arabia has a lot to offer. It has a lot of money and um, oil resources. So uh, it's in a very different position uh, and um, having Saudi Arabia in China's camp is a major goal. Pulling it away from the U.S. is an anchor for China's position here. When um, Xi Jinping came out with the Global Security Initiative, uh, Wang Yi, um, you know, the top uh, diplomatic uh, official of the country, said this will become the security architecture of the Middle East, specifically said that. Now, prior to COVID, there were uh, yearly gatherings hosted by China between Israelis and Palestinian talks, but they were all uh, with non-official players, which um, didn't really lead to much, except China got a little bit of uh, pro-propaganda uh, that they were helping the Palestinian tribes. Well, late, they, uh, after the success with the Saudi-Iran rapprochement, where they invested a few months of effort, uh, where the Qataris and the, uh, uh, was it, maybe it was Oman, who had done the heavy lifting along with Iraq. Uh, but China came in towards the end, definitely made a, a, a contribution. And uh, that success far uh, outweighed their expectations. They did not realize that they were going to get so much play from that achievement. And it led them to pick up the phone for the first time ever to have the foreign minister back then before when Qin Gang was still in, in his role, uh, called up the Israeli foreign minister and the foreign minister of the Palestinian Authority and said, uh, we're happy to mediate and bring this problem into the United Nations. And of course, uh, it's well known that Israel is despised in the United Nations, never gets a fair shake, and bringing anything about Israel into the United Nations is uh, anathema for Israel and, and equal to failure. Uh, nonetheless, China made that offer. Um, I think China's interest is uh, establishing the Global Security Initiative, which is also a non-starter for Israel with the concept of indivisible security where uh, uh, the security needs are equated for us between the Palestinians and the Israelis. It, it's, um, it doesn't speak to the problem where we are the subject of Palestinian terror on a permanent ongoing basis. Yes, the media in China portrays it as Israel being the aggressor, but in fact, we are the victims of terror over and over and over. And the reason we have to have all of these checkpoints, et cetera, et cetera, is because we keep getting blown up. So um, how uh, uh, my, my understanding of the end game here right now, China on the one hand has its goals. It wants to sideline the US, 
keep uh, Saudi Arabia in its orbit, strengthen the um, uh, axis of countries that are under uh, the, the sort of China umbrella of, quote, global south countries and have some of these stronger countries like Saudi Arabia in that camp. However, after this terrible failure on the part of Israel, and, and there are reasons, uh, there are many reasons unknown, but there are a couple of reasons that are known, and they're not good. Uh, one of the reasons I think that Israel let down its guard is because Hamas had been behaving uh, incrementally more like a responsible actor. And Israel wanted to believe the fantasy, like everyone else, that there's hope for, for peace, hope for progress, and let down its guard. Uh, and that, along with uh, the infighting that we had uh, over the last nine months, distracted too many people. And for that, and as well as other reasons that will come out later, uh, we were, um, you know, we dropped the ball. Our security people dropped the ball. And that's over. Israel has regrouped. We are now, we and the rest of the world are now aware of who we are dealing with. And there is no possibility when you live next to a monster, you have two choices. The monster eats you or you kill it. And those are the, you know, it's, it's a terrible thing, but you can't live next to a monster who's constantly coming and trying to destroy you. So um, that will happen. And if Hezbollah decides to join in, I don't know uh, when the U.S. battleship pulled into the Mediterranean. It was a very strong message, not only to Hezbollah of what they might expect, because Americans were killed and Americans were probably kidnapped and taken hostage, which gives America the uh, uh, ability to get involved should that be useful. But it also speaks to Saudi Arabia and the other countries of the region that if you're like Israel or you are working with Israel, you have an opportunity to gain the kind of security umbrella that Israel has. And that, in my opinion, you want to talk about where is the Middle East going? I see a new Middle East that we none, none of us could have predicted on its way, where um, we have this war, we reshape the, the immediate neighborhood based on the results of that war, that normalization follows with Saudi Arabia, that other Arab countries see the benefits and join in. And at that point, China will have to rethink its approach to Israel, because until now, Israel was a very useful card. If you uh, uh, throw Israel under the bus, and China doesn't like to hear it, but it's the truth. If you throw Israel under the bus, the idea was you're going to get support of the 56 Muslim states and certainly the 22 in the Arab League. And um, if many countries in the Arab League are normalized with Israel, working with Israel, changing their views of Israel, you can't do that anymore. Now you're going to have to work with Israel to gain the support of those countries. Um, and that, in turn, throws a bit of a stick in the spokes of the Iran-China relationship. Anything you want to leave our Chinese, American, European, global listenership with? Yeah, I do want to mention that um, one aspect of this conflict that is not being mentioned but is uh, an underlying critical factor is the civil war within Islam that is uh, basically Iran versus Saudi Arabia, Sunni versus Shia, uh, where um, Iran is looking to establish an Islamic, Islamist, uh, um, more extremist leadership and take the world global Muslim population into a more extremist direction. And Saudi Arabia and Morocco are working towards a more moderate Islam. And this is being played out right now we're in the crosshairs, as usual, we Israel, we're on the front lines. And how this ends up is going to impact 
many, many parts of the world. And I think people need to be aware and, um, and, and support Israel's efforts, not only because we were butchered, but also because we're on the front lines uh, working for a, a world order of stability and of moderation that I think is desired by, by most countries. Chris, thanks for being a part of Shanzo. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Ophir Dayan works at the Institute for National Security Studies based in Tel Aviv. She's a China Middle East policy analyst, uh, also recording this the uh, a.m. Eastern time, Tuesday, October 10th. Ophir, uh, talk us through your past few days. So if I had to choose one word to describe what Israel and Israelis have been experiencing over the last uh, three and a little more than three days, uh, is surreal. I think that things that um, unfolded on the ground are uh, scenarios that Israelis didn't think possible. Uh, it's, in, in a way, the worst nightmare of Israelis. Uh, I think the past uh, three three days were, for Israelis, uh, a wake-up a wake call. Uh, we've seen hundreds, almost a thousand uh, Israelis killed. We've seen... Um, I, I assume what to be uh, over a hundred Israelis, including civilians and children and, and the elderly um, kidnapped into Gaza. Um, I think it's important to understand how um, sure Israel was um, in the strength of its army uh, and in the weakness of Hamas uh, in comparison. And, and how there is a, a, a misconception, there, there was a huge misconception about about the, the power balance here. And I think many Israelis, including myself, um, are even now, more than three days after this war broke, uh, a bit in, a, in disbelief uh, of what's been happening. Um, and, and again, I'm going to use the words for real. We've seen sites, um, they're very graphic, so I'm, I'm not going to repeat them here, but, but we, we never thought we we're going to see uh, this sort of fighting taking place inside Israel. Um, we never thought we'd see the number, the sheer number of uh, people kidnapped and uh, murdered by Hamas. And I'm going to say one more thing, which I think it's very important to understand here. We've seen ISIS-styled uh, acts by Hamas. And I think that also is, is a very important aspect in terms of, first of all, you know, the, the people killed and, and abused, but also uh, the psych, uh, the, the national psych, I think, that we've, um, it, it adds to the to the shock and the trauma that we've been experiencing, and and since it's taken place in 2023, everything is recorded, everything is on social media, um, and people are exposed to it. And um, lastly, I'm going to say that only the, the sheer number of people uh, missing, the people murdered, means that every single Israeli knows at least one, if not more. Um, of, of, you know, someone who is directly impacted by the fighting, whether it be, you know, a murdered individual, a, a hostage being held in Gaza, someone missing. Um, and, and I think that's very, it's, it's, it's a big turning point for Israeli society and for myself in how we view ourselves and our enemies in this region, both in terms of their strength and in terms of their um, brutality. Oh, fear. Well, let's let's tease that out a little bit. Uh, what's the sort of before and after? I mean, you know, it is a terrorist organization. They have been bombing uh, Israelis for a long time now. Um, but sort of what 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 about the kind of ISIS, uh, you know, inspired uh, uh, dimension as well as the scale um, sort of changes, uh, you know, how the government and how the people. Uh, sort of interpret their, I don't know, pl the broader security environment? So I'm going to say something that um, it's going to be very sad, but for the past 18 years, Israelis got used uh, to to being bombarded by Hamas, um, by rockets, by um, water shells. We just got used to it. Um, and it's no longer something that is completely shocking or destabilizing to us. We are used to having this um, mini conflict with Hamas once every few years. But this one is different. Um, I think what makes it different is the surprise. Um, you know, we woke up Saturday morning, 6.30 a.m. Uh, Israel time with 
uncertainty of what's even happening uh, on Israeli territory. Um, entire communities were held by Hamas. They were, you know, they were taken over by a terrorist organization. Um, and, and this surprise of something we never thought possible and the way that it took um, the Israeli defense forces and the police many, many hours to um, intervene, I think that's, um, that's, that's different from other times. Um, but I think what makes it uh, very different than other times, which is, I think, the most destabilizing thing, is that we are used to... I don't want to be, I don't want to say sterile warfare, but to bombs and aircraft um, in response, we're not used to them infiltrating Israeli territory in this scale, taking, you know, more than 100 Israelis, civilians, hostages, uh, and killing almost 1,000 uh, Israelis. Uh, what's your, what's your sense of the sort of, um, Ophir, why don't you give a, a little background of uh, China-Israel um, relations as well as what, um, uh, you know, what China has been pursuing over the past few years uh, in the broader Middle East? Okay, so, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start this way. Um, diplomatic relations between China and Israel has only been a thing since the 90s. So um, even the, the broader context of Israeli-China relations is, is pretty recent uh, in terms of international relations. Um, the relationship between China and Israel is based a lot on economic um, and trade relations. Uh, China is viewed here in Israel as an economic partner, not as a strategic partner in the same way the U.S. is perceived here in Israel. Um, yet, I'm going to say this way, look, even though China is perceived here as a, as a trade partner more than um, a strategic one, People here um, like China. They value China. People here travel to China. They um, buy Chinese products. Uh, before this entire thing started, we even uh, were talking about a planned trip by the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to China, uh, a trip that stirred controversy because, um, you know, Netanyahu and his, and his closest uh, compatriots even floated around this idea of, of China you know, of this trip being a realignment in the Israeli, um, in the Israeli uh, alliances system, a little more towards China than than the U.S. And we need to understand the context that this is coming from. Uh, people view China um, very differently than people in the U.S. view China. Well, people in the U.S. view China as a as, a, as competition, as a threat. In Israel, China is an inspiration. Uh, we look at how you know. China builds magnificent structures and, and huge projects. Um, and here in Israel as well, by the way. Um, so, so that's how Israelis view China. And I think in this context, it was very disappointing for many Israelis to see the Chinese response, um, especially compared to the American response and to other Western nations. Um, while President Joe Biden unequivocally uh, supports Israel, um, gave several statements, is sending, uh, you know, um, Navy vassals here, sending uh, military assistance. Uh, China couldn't even bring itself to properly denounce Hamas, um, it, you know, something that is very basic. And even people as anti-Israel as Ilhan Omar, uh, the Congress member for the U.S., uh, she even condemned Hamas. Uh, more than China, and no Israeli thought that Han Oma would be a better ally of Israel than China. Um, I, I think that's that's a bit surreal to see uh, Ilhan Omar saying that she's horrified by by the crimes Hamas is committing, and China saying they hope for uh, all sides to remain calm. I think I think that that's a bit surreal for us. Um, this entire idea is magnified by the fact that there is a Chinese citizen, um, at least one. Um, directly affected by the fighting, um, uh, and a citizen called Noah. She's um, a young Israeli, uh, Chinese Israeli, being held in Gaza. Um, her mom is Chinese, um, and there was a very viral video of her being kidnapped into Gaza. Um, you know, she she has been kidnapped by Hamas, and and 
first of all, uh, if I might say, she's she's a very beautiful uh, young lady, uh, which, you know, when you look at it, it's just sad. She's she's there surrounded by Hamas uh, um, terrorists, and, and she's saying, please don't kill me. Um, and it's been on the cover um, on of many international uh, news outlets, uh, many newspapers, and and China, um, where she's a citizen, has been. Uh, their response was was rather disappointing. So I, I'm sorry. I think she's. Is, is it? it uh, we know her mother is a citizen. I'm not sure she's she's like a passport holder. Um, is that is that confirmed if you're or what's the dynamic there? I think as as far as the reports here goes, uh, she she's a Chinese citizen. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, it's tricky because like you can't like China doesn't. Yeah, dual yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so so she's not recognized by China as a citizen because she has dual citizenship. So, which again is a concept that is very foreign to Israelis because there are many Israelis with dual citizenship, so they don't understand why in this case it's it's not something that prompts reaction. Gotcha. Oh, well, Ophir, let's take us let's take a step back then and talk about, um, you know, China's broader ambitions in the Middle East. We saw them being very proud of brokering this, um, you know, deal between Iran and and Saudi Arabia. We'll see where that leaves. Uh, you know, we'll see where that ends up after uh, you know the dust settles from this war. But, um, you know, what what are what is the the the, the relationship that. Uh, China particularly has been trying to develop uh, with Iran. Um, you know, how is that seen now um, following following an, uh, an attack of uh, the magnitude like this? Look, I, I must be completely honest with you. I think Israelis are less um, engaged in, in, in the China discussion here in the Middle East. This is something that we people who um, who monitor China uh, very closely, this is something that is very disturbing to us. The, the average Israeli, I'm, I'm not sure even, you know, knows or or takes account of, of China's actions here in the Middle East. Um, but I would say, though, that every uh, interaction between a foreign government and Iran is seen as very negative here in, in Israel, especially by a government like China, uh, a country that Israelis uh, consider as a friend. Um, I think that um, while the, the tension between the U.S. and China is very evident and very understood by uh, analysts here in Israel, the average Israeli is less aware of it. Um, and they, they view China as, you know, as, as, as a friendly country. Um, so it's lack of ability to condemn Hamas properly. Um, and, you know, more than that, it's, it's alignment with Iran. Is seen very negatively here, um, and they will be viewed even more negatively when when Israelis will be more aware of this connection. Um, so, if you're, let me read you this tweet. I'm curious for your response. Uh, Ryan Haas from Brookings tweeted: um, "Time will tell, but my expectation is that China's cautious response to Hamas's attack in Israel will expose the limits of PRC influence in the re region. Beijing historically has been wary of being drawn into taking sides." I don't expect that to uh, thoughts or, or response to that, uh, that, that sentiment up here. I think that's a very good analysis of what's been happening. Um, while the United States is extremely involved in what's happening over the last uh, little more than three, three days, uh, China is, is, not, is not as involved um, rhetorically by not being able to condemn Hamas like other nations did. Um, but also on the ground, I, I want to remind our listeners that a few years back, China even proposed to mediate uh, between Israel and the Palestinians. Like, yeah, it did the same, um, I think, last year as well. Um, and those are attempts that Israelis are aware of. Uh, they know that China views itself as as some sort of a, a potential mediator uh, in, in the never-ending Middle Eastern conflict. Um, even a, you know, a survey that was conducted a few months ago um, with uh, Arabs, young Arabs in the Middle East, showed that they prefer China to the U.S. as a mediator. But in times like this, someone, uh, a country that views itself as a possible mediator, uh, should be uh, more involved and not, you know, sit on the sidelines and and say, you know, bad people on bad people on both sides. And that's practically what China has been doing so far. Um, I think China is also showing its 
um, lack of nuance uh, of what's been happening here. Uh, the sides here are not even, uh, especially when you ask Israelis. Um, and China kind of makes this comparison. Um, and while the United States is sending military assistance, which is, again, very, very unusual, uh, it also shows solidarity on um, on other levels. It, the White House was colored uh, blue and white as uh, the Eiffel Tower uh, and the Brandenburg Gate in, in Germany. We don't see that solidarity from China. Um, but I think it's important to understand how you know, Europeans and, and Americans are also uh, very familiar to Israelis. They travel here. And although there are many Chinese tourists in Israel, um, Israelis know less about Chinese culture. They know less Chinese individuals. Um, so, so even on the human level um, and on social media, they interact less with Chinese people than they interact with Americans or with Europeans and other English-speaking uh, countries. So. So um, China is, I would say, cautiously unfelt here uh, by, by Israelis, and I, I would even say by, by Israeli leadership. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, there's sort of the context, I guess, of like ISIS-style exposure, I think, which China... And the Chinese, uh, you know, people as well as Chinese leadership really haven't hasn't had. I mean, you know, in terms of uh, a terrorist attacks, right? We've had some knife stuff and a threatened car bomb, uh, which has kind of been it over the past fifteen years. And I think that's very different than, um, you know, in European, uh, you know, bombings and and killings across Europe as well as. Um, as well as in the U.S. and and in the Middle East, where where you know America had um uh, uh, had troops in, in in Iraq and Afghanistan for um uh, for years and years. So I think there's sort of um uh, uh, the, the 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 comparisons are maybe easier um, to draw um, given the proximity of uh, uh, of of sort of similar experience, I guess. Um, of and I think it's a, it's important also to note that in terms of um, values, there is more similarity between um, the values in which Israel is built upon and, and American and Western values. Um, it's easier for, you know, democratic countries like the U.S. and the U.K. understand how it is um, felt by Israelis when, when a non-democratic society uh, is in conflict with a democratic society, which is something that is not shared by China. Um, what's a, a kind of interesting parallel that was, uh, pointed out by, uh, your colleague Tuvia, uh, Gehring, who couldn't join us today because he was called up, um, is the, is the sort of echo that you're seeing in China's response to the Russia, Ukraine, um, uh, fight and the way it's portrayed on, um, on official media to, um, uh, to how they're talking about. Uh, uh, Hamas's attacks and Israel's response, where you basically have this um, uh, uh, this this narrative of you know uh, like uh, uh, the devastation caused in this case by uh, you know over the past year by Ukraine, in this case by uh, uh, Israel, sort of no real context on like why those things are happening, um, and then uh, you know one or two sort of nods, or maybe not even a nod. Uh, uh, it was sort of incredible, I thought, in Simon Liambo, how they didn't even mention um, the fact that, uh, you know, hundreds of Israelis uh, civilians were um, uh, were killed, which is why, uh, you know, you saw those um, uh, you saw the images in the first half of the sort of little clip of um, uh, of attacks in Gaza happening in the first place. And then you kind of close it with, uh, by the way, this is actually all America's fault because, you know, they're the they're the, the bad actors. So um it, it, it is sort of like a surreal um, playbook to, I mean, to it's it's surreal, but like, I guess kind of understandable given that she has this relationship with Putin and, and sees them as a strategic ally, but to sort of, um, you know, in, in a sense, put Putin's the, the, a superpower or sort of superpower in Russia on the same level as Hamas um, is, is just a wild thing to, um, to, 
to, to, to see happening in real time. Yeah, definitely. I, I definitely agree with that. So Adam, uh, I'm going to start with you. Um, you memorably used the phrase economic long COVID to describe what's going on with China's economy right now. Explain what you mean by that. Thank you for having me back on Foreign Policy Live, Ravi, especially with these two other great guests. Uh, the key thing in making economic analysis, I believe, is trying to say conditional on what? Is, is something just a random variation? Is something a change in a trend, a particular incident? And so there's been, since my article came out, a lot of focus on bad data from China. And as you pointed out, there's some very scary long-term data on demographics, on youth unemployment, things Ling Ling and James have written about. I coined the term economic long COVID because I do think we're at a turning point. And the turning point is not just the ongoing slowdown of Chinese growth as they've built the economy and fewer people are moving from the informal agriculture to the urban sector. Economic long COVID, in my view, is what happened after COVID. And it's a persistent drag on consumer and small business behavior. So in the sense not to be too morbid, but that you're sluggish and your immune system is weird as for some people after they've had COVID. Now, why do I make this analogy? First, what puts me onto it is the fact that most other economies, including Asian economies, including the other large economies and high income economies had a real boom when they reopened after COVID. Most forecasters expected such a boom in China. We didn't get that. We got a brief uptick. And then when I started looking into it more, we saw a huge shift of Chinese households, Chinese small business cutting way back on their purchases of durable goods, on their investment, and putting more and more of their savings into savings accounts, liquid assets, rather than just investing abroad. Now, some of that, of course, is they have a real estate problem. But to me, what happened was since roughly 2015, President Xi and the Chinese Communist Party leadership have been more and more intrusive into the Chinese economy. They've been more interventionist in various arbitrary ways. Everyone was aware of the famous interactions with Alibaba, with various tech companies, various moguls. For the average Chinese person or household, this wasn't in their face because if you were unfortunately a Muslim Uyghur, if you were a democracy protester, Yes, the state got in your way. But for an average Han Chinese person going about their business, there was what I called no politics, no problem since Deng Xiaoping. They would just let you get on with your commercial business as long as you didn't do anything political. And suddenly with zero COVID, it's in everyone's face just how arbitrary and powerful the Communist Party could be. Everyone knew that. But suddenly people on one side of the street were in complete lockdown and the other people were not. And this would be made in very arbitrary seeming ways by the party powers. And so this to me has induced, I would call it an immune response essentially of the private sector to government stimulus programs, to government announcements, because they're never sure how they're going to be implemented, when they'll be reversed. Because remember, even when they reopened after COVID, as Ling Ling and James have written about, they initially said, oh, we're going to do this slowly. And then suddenly on a dime, they reopened completely in late November, December. So there's been this series of shocks. And so this going forward, I think, in addition to whatever long-term things are dragging down the Chinese economy and growth rate and whatever short-term problems they have in the real estate sector, I think for the next several years, there's going to be this bias or distortion that the consumers, the small business, essentially the normal people are going to be more fearful than they've been. And that mm -hmm. is something we've seen in other countries in Latin America, in Russia, in Turkey, when an autocrat basically walks away from letting commerce take place.
Mm. Um, Ling Ling, let me bring you in now. I mean, you you live in New York these days, but you've lived in China for many years. You've covered its economic rise. You've covered the slowdown of the last few years. Um, some of what Adam's describing is uh, a stifling of, you know, the animal spirits in the economy of consumer sentiment. Um, is that what you see as well in your reporting? Uh, sure. Thank you so much for having me here on uh, Foreign Policy Live. And, um, you know, I also wanted to just really uh, commend Adam for that essay that really uh, triggered a lot of uh, discussion about China's economic slowdown. Um, I agree with uh, what Adam just described. And, uh, you know, I do feel like, you know, we are at a turning point for China's economy. You know, China's economy for most of the past four decades has consistently defied economic cycles, right? You know, when some slowdown uh, occurred, the government immediately responded and then, you know, uh, jacked the growth out of the funk. So, but now we are um, in a, a period of time when, you know, the economic slowdown is going to be, um, you know, many years to come. Uh, now the debate is over whether or not it's a protracted slowdown, you know, uh, lower growth rates or a more uh, worrisome you know, collapse of the economy, you know, because of the risks we are seeing in financial sector and property sector. Um, you know, um, Adam talked about the uh, uh, hit to private sector as a result of uh, government's interventionist policy. And I completely agree with that. Um, you know, that's definitely what we have seen over the past few years, especially uh, since 2020. Uh, it really is one measure after another. Alibaba, Tencent, you know, the private tutoring sector, you name it. And most recently, we have seen the kind of a clampdown on foreign businesses in the name of national security. Uh, so all that is, is, is you know, is pretty um, obvious and, 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 you know, it's very uh, disconcerting. Uh, I would just add uh, that, you know, obviously, um, you know, um, uh, a lot of other issues are kind of long time, many years in the making, uh, especially problems in the property sector, uh, prob problems uh, problems uh, triggered by the kind of over reliance on investment. You know, that kind of problem really predated Xi Jinping. Uh, but uh, I do agree that uh, President Xi Jinping probably has played an outside role in creating the situation we are in today precisely uh, for the, um, you know, uh, issues Adam raised, you know, the hit to pri uh, private sector. Uh, so I just wanted to you know, add a few points on the longer term structural problems that have been, you know, there um, for China for many years, ever since probably, you know, in mid 2000s uh, and, and really escalated after the uh, 2008, 2009 global financial crisis after China really launched a massive stimulus program, you know, that led to overbuilding and overborrowing, um, you know, uh, so those problems were already there by the time Xi Jinping came to power in late 2012. And he came to power with a lot of promises, right? And, um, you know, people thought, you know, a lot of people in China wanted a strong leader at the helm, a stronger leader than Hu Jintao. And the hope was not, you know, for uh, to see the kind of uh, uh, control we're seeing today. But the hope back then was finally someone who's strong enough, who's decisive enough, who could push through a lot of uh, changes the economy badly needed, like, you know, remake the economic model to make it more consumption driven, just like the United States economy and less driven by investment, less driven by debt. So that's the kind of hope a lot of people in policy making circles had, a lot of private business people had. But over the years, we really didn't see that happening. In, you know, in, as a matter of fact, as Adam pointed out, you know, um, kind of backpedaled on a lot of reform uh, promises. Mm. Private sector got squeezed even further. In terms of property, um, you know, 
right now people gave uh, Xi Jinping a lot of credit for finally being willing to take on the sector. But let's, you know, we should lose sight of the fact that the bubble got so big uh, because of the policy he put in place in 2015, 2016, that significantly triggered, uh, inflated the bubble even more. So mm. in China's policy making circles, you know, the property sector was nicknamed honeypot because you can always lean on that sector to boost growth. So and now we're seeing they're finally trying to deflate the bubble. We saw the government trying to cut off liquidity for some over levered developers, but there's no follow through how to mm. help them this restructure that how to help, you know, developers uh, finish unfinished projects, how to help homeowners, those things we haven't really seen seeing much government action on. So I completely agree with uh, Adam on the points he made about the government's interventionist mm. policy that dealt blow to the private sector. And at the same time, we just add that a lot of long-term structural problems like debt, right. like property, are, have always been there. And the government hasn't done really done much to help solve those problems as well. Right. James, let me bring you in. I think one through line I'm hearing uh, between what both Adam and Ling Ling have been describing is that uh, when you have an authoritarian leader, uh, there is always a risk of that leader overreaching um, and perhaps, you know, not being able to listen to uh, advisors who may have alternate viewpoints or viewpoints grounded in real economic data. Um, but I want to ask you, how likely is it then that she could reverse course uh, or find an alternate path. One thing that surprised me with uh, the COVID lockdowns, for example, is um, just as draconian as it was, um, suddenly he sort of reversed course when I think uh, Beijing got a sense that there was public resentment and anger. Um, so authoritarians can reverse course when they need to. What's your sense of how much they're engaging with these criticisms with the data we're all describing, and how how could they try a different path? So I'd say with zero COVID, the reversal came about essentially because they realized that the current policy was literally impossible, that the numbers were spreading too fast, um, that COVID had broken containment, slash um, the public resentment had reached a, a, a peak. And so I think they're capable of changing direction when it's become imp literally impossible to sustain the previous uh, policy, as in this case. And that might happen with the economy. Like it, it might be that things get so bad that there's no choice but to change course. My, uh, the, the worry I have is not so much that she isn't listening to people himself, but that he's created an atmosphere where nobody will speak up in the first place and where the space for discussion around economic policy and especially around the ideological aspect of economic policy has been so constrained. And for a long time, it was relatively open. Um, it was very vigorously discussed in the 2000s, even in the, in the mid 2010s, partially because most of the Communist Party doesn't understand economics. And so most of the censors didn't participate in this space or restrict the space because they didn't know what any of these people were talking about. Um, since sort of the late 2010s or so, though, we've seen that space really constrict and the ability to discuss these problems openly has become much narrower. That's a big problem. Um, it's a big problem in terms of the ideas coming up. It's a big problem in terms of um, the willingness to tackle hard problems. I think a little bit more space has opened up as a result of the crisis this year, but some, but whether anybody's going to be brave enough to to actually say we got it wrong before or whether you're going to have these kind of framings which is always of course the uh, chairman xi jinping's policy was completely correct up until 2023 and now his new policy which should be this will also be correct um i think there's also genuine political risk to xi i think that his the sense among the chinese sort of elite especially the the upper middle class who are really the bedrock of party support in the cities that he that he's failed has become more and more acute now is there anything that anybody can do about that under a very tightly controlled party and surveillance state probably not but it's something he has to have in the back of his mind and that i think could convince him that he has to 
give some concessions. But it's equally likely, perhaps even more likely, that he'll double down on this on aspects like the Common Prosperity Campaign, which have really re-emphasized kind of um, Maoist or Marxist values, um, and that he will see any criticism as essentially an attempt to undermine him and so stomp on it even harder. Mm. Adam, uh, you know, a question that often comes up with China is why it can't simply spend its way out of trouble. It's right. done it before. Um, obviously, its debt to GDP ratio now has dramatically risen uh, past America's as well. Um, but what is to stop it from continuing uh, to spend its way out of trouble? So, Ravi, I think there's three things going on. Um, first, in a sense, following Ling Ling and other writers about this, there is diminishing returns. I mean, Japan ran into some of this in the 90s, as did Korea, that, that if you're not doing the most useful infrastructure projects or the most in-demand real estate projects, your spending doesn't get you as much bang for your buck. But I don't think that should be exaggerated too far because as Keynes famously argued, and we've seen, you can bury bricks in the, in the ground and it still creates employment and consumption. Um, so it's there, it's less efficient, but not. A second issue relates to James's points about political matters, that she has a lot of control. He's making decisions with his small group of elite and smaller set of information sources in a certain ideological context. And again, I'm not the expert in this, but I rely on others. But it's very clear from his speeches, you know, about eating bitterness, about toughening things up against welfareism, that he doesn't want to do handouts. He's worried about creating he sounds almost like Reagan in the 80s. He's, he's worried about creating this sort of culture of dependency. Um, and I just want to point out that's not entirely new. If you go back to Ezra Vogel's great biography of Deng Xiaoping, there's long descriptions of how between 79 and 92, Deng was, of course, in charge, but was still going back and forth with, I think it was Chen Yuan, um, the head of the China Development Bank, or excuse me, the head of a lot of economic things. I'm getting confused with his son. I apologize. Um, uh, uh, who was very much arguing, don't do stimulus. It's empty calories, not in those terms. So there's that. And so, but to me, the reason they can't spend their way out right now is because of this economic long COVID. So on the one hand, that diminishes significantly the response of any cuts in interest rates or or subsidies to buy autos, all both of which have been tried recently. Uh, the, the private sector, the, again, I want to stress the households and small business people are just not reacting to it because they just don't want to tie up their money and they're worried it could change or be differently implemented at any time. But additionally, I think this reinforces a tendency which my colleague Nicholas Lardy of Peterson identified a decade ago uh, to put more and more emphasis on credit and spending by the state-owned enterprise sector. And she, I think, I'm just in, interpreting from the outside, sees lack of response to stimulus for the small, normal private sector, uh, is worried ideologically about <laughs> reinforcing bad habits. And so he starts putting more money into the state-owned enterprise sector, into reinforced by the national security concerns that obviously foreign policy writes about a lot, you know, to be self-sufficient, to be not dependent on the U.S. To, but anyway, you put all that together and you get a cycle where she is spending more money to less and less effect and reinforcing the concerns of the private sector. And so it's not necessarily a death spiral, but it is a feedback loop that makes it harder for them to spend out. I just want to add one last point, though. On the pure economics of it, I want to emphasize the rightness of your question, which is as bad as the banking sector problem is, or really the real estate sector problem is, as messed up as local government finances are in China, which our colleagues have written about, they can spend their way out if they decide to and they design it right. They're so far, they're designing it wrong, and therefore it's becoming less and less effective. Mm. Um, we'll come a little bit later to what China should do or what the world should do. Uh, but Ling Ling, um, one thing Adam mentioned about a feedback loop 
Um, and James also riffed on uh, how the Chinese people seem disappointed and let down uh, by the state of the economy. I want to interrogate that just a little bit more because um, I'm curious whether the Chinese pe people have uh, a broader sort of sense of perspective as well. I mean, after all, A, you know, 4 or 5% growth is still faster than much of the rest of the world, certainly the West. Um, but also when you look at uh, the last four decades, there must be a sense of societal memory of, of how, you know, the, the growth model that you've written about in your book that worked so well, are people ready to abandon that? Are people ready to be angry with uh, the government that has brought them thus far? So when we assume that there is a feedback loop, I mean, are the people really unhappy? Is that a sense that could sustain itself? Uh, thank you, Ravi. Uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, if there is a one word to describe the mood in China these days among ordinary people, private business owners or, you know, others, the word would be downbeat. Um, you know, we all remember when, you know, James was in China and we're in, based in China covering the Chinese society and economy, the kind of animal spirit right, the kind of entrepreneur uh, drive uh, that was, uh, you know, very impressive and unforgettable. So uh, these days, the, the biggest problem faced by China's economy really is the lack of confidence. Um, you know, the confidence is really at the lowest level since the uh, late uh, 1970s uh, when Deng Xiaoping uh, launched the reform and the opening initiative. And why is that? It's because, you know, for most of the past four decades, the overarching political agenda has been developing the economy. And the Chinese people knew that, you know, a better life uh, for themselves, for their children would be totally possible as long as they worked hard. There are uh, plenty of opportunities. So that really unleashed this kind of animal spirit, entrepreneur drive that powered Chinese innovation and private investment in China. So yes, the model, the investment driven model really worked for a long time for China because China was poor. They needed a lot of infrastructure. They needed a lot of factories. And then gradually the government also kind of, uh, you know, made way, uh, made room for private businesses, private, you know, individuals to let them flourish. So both uh, factors combined together that's the result of 40, 40 years of boom. We, we had witnessed the most successful economic story, miracle in the whole world. But now, you know, as James and uh, Adam pointed out, there has been a clear shift under Xi Jinping in terms of the top line agenda. It's no longer development, you know, trumped everything else, but security. So instead of trying to have a good relationship with the West, which really was the core of reform and opening of years past. Now China is more focused on confronting the US and its allies and building up a geopolitically resilient economy against perceived Western threats. So that kind of changing focus has contributed to this class in foreign direct investment, more restricted access to Western markets for made in China products and all that has really dampened confidence in the economy. You know, that's partly why, you know, people are not uh, expanding investments too much. They're not um, consuming uh, too much. So this kind of, uh, um, you know, lack of confidence in China's economy, it's, it's really, you know, in, uh, based on our reporting, uh, it has really is um, one of the biggest problems faced by uh, China today. Mm -hmm. Ravi, could I just add one name to what Ling Ling said? Sorry, James. Um, I mean, and I read her and her colleagues' reporting, so this is the picture I have. But there, there is a key point that I've tried to make in my article and elsewhere, which I think also needs to come out, which is when an autocrat decides to back off non-intervention or putting it more positively, decides to be more aggressive in intervening in the economy, it's not just the confidence goes away, in in the sense of bad performance necessarily 
but that it's almost impossible for the autocrat to say in a credible way, I'm not going to do this again. I'm not going to do it. And this relates to what James was saying about the, the issues of reputation and, and, and performance for she, he, he can say, I didn't make a mistake before. I didn't make a mistake now, but the key thing is, even if he says we're, we're going back to letting in foreign direct investment, or we're going back to letting private business do things, it's not credible because he's, he, he's crossed the line. And that to me is the key part, along with the things Ling Ling said of the Chinese economic miracle was that from 79 under Deng, basically and through Xi's predecessors up till he takes office in 2013, a little after, they were credible. They held themselves back in the economics here. They were, you know, barbaric and autocratic in all kinds of other spheres, but in economics, they held themselves back. And now the she's crossed that line. I don't think people can believe him that he will hold himself back. James, I'm curious how much youth unemployment uh, plays a part in public sentiment. Um, and then linked to all of that, I mean, we have been talking about a decline in foreign investment. Um, but uh, some of that, of course, is it's both ways. I mean, the, there's de-risking uh, as a sentiment on the part of the West. Um, China is focused on security as well, but then surely uh, domestic uh, consumption and domestic demand uh, also has to pick up to to make room for that. So on youth unemployment, there's a, a very huge and obvious kind of morale crisis among Chinese under 30s, uh, maybe even I would say under 40s. And it's not just the generation that is coming into a dire job market now. Uh, so that you have, you know, youth unemployment of at least 21%, probably higher. It's also the generation that feels that they did everything right, that they strove, that they went through the Gaokao, the, the national examination system, that they put in all this effort, that they did the insane hours and long work culture, and that they're not getting rewarded for it. When we talk about, like, do people think of the past, do they compare it to the past? The truth is they mostly don't. Most people, people, firstly, this generation grew up with a, uh, developed China, or at least developed China in the in the big cities where they're, they're mostly from. Um, secondly, people just adjust to the norms of the day. They you you base your expectations mostly on the last few years, not on not on your childhood. I mean, I think of you know um, when I first used the internet in like 1993 or so, and was like, oh my god, this is a miracle. And now, if my Wi-Fi fails for two seconds, I'm furious at the world and everything in it. Um, and it's the same. It's the same in China. That you're after years and years of growth. You're used to growth and the expectations of growth, and you've also made a bunch of economic decisions based on the assumption that you're going to keep growing at eight percent. That you're that things are going to be as good. That things are going to stay good. Uh, people have made personal financial decisions as well as business decisions based on that. Mm. So yeah, with young people, there's a. a, a overwhelming sense of almost despair like um there's and part of that is also that the government has kept sticking its nose into everything to a degree that's sharply different from even the china of 10 years ago and this isn't just that the government has like shut down your business if you're if you were doing like private tuition or um made you go through a bunch of self-examinations in the tech sector it's that like the Communist Party, which you joined because you kind of had to and you thought it was a way of getting a ahead, is now making you do like three meetings a week instead of one meeting a month. Um, your favorite streaming shows have been taken off because, um, you know, Two and a Half Men has been deemed ideologically irresponsible. Um, your, your WeChat groups have been shut down. The sense of the government sticking its nose into everything has um, became prominent even before COVID. And as Adam said, the arbitrariness of COVID itself that really upped the awareness that the, the the government could be in your business at any moment. And for a long time, people kind of thought, well, as long as I don't cross the line and things will be fine. Now, in reality, the lines were shifting all the time and people walked across those lines without realizing it. But now they realize that the lines are just going and there's no way you can be be safe. No, nothing that will protect you from kind of the the eye of Mordor. 
That's a great analogy there. Um, Adam, uh, just to broaden this out a bit. So China's economy is slowing. Uh, the prognosis does not look great. I'm curious, and many of our subscribers have written in with a version of this question. Um, what are the downsides for the world um, if China continues to slow down? Uh, a lot, <laughs> but not quite necessarily the direct ones, Robbie, that some people worry about. So there's clearly China has provided a huge share of global growth for the last 15 to 20 years. It's roughly 20 percent, 25 percent of the world economy. It's a bigger share of trade. And so if China's growing more slowly, they're taking in less exports like copper from Chile um, and, and inputs from Mexico and Thailand and Indonesia than they were, uh, as well as high-level business services and inputs from the U.S. So that's not fun. Uh, also, for good reason, there's a lot of people who've invested in China, both corporations investing directly and people whose savings uh, from abroad have moved into China. If those are more at risk from political factors or performing less well because of these economic trend dynamics, that makes people poorer on a forward-looking basis. And it means diversification is less effective. Additionally, going more into the foreign policy sphere, there is the risk of China potentially becoming more aggressive. Um, the President Biden has mentioned this a couple of times. Now, my understanding, based on colleagues of mine like Colin Hendricks and others, is that the political science literature isn't all that clear on this. There's a, some empirical evidence of wag the dog that a country that has deep economic problems um, is more likely to be aggressive and try to distract with foreign policy or national security efforts. But there's also an argument that if China's economy is weaker, then maybe they've got less capacity to project power. So it, it's not clear. But the thing I would emphasize most, and it goes to some of the very apt and chilling eye of Mordor and other discussions that Ling Ling and James made, which is a China that's demographically out of whack because of the one child policy and all the things and the gender selection, and all the things that came with that through the years, and that is not meeting the reasonable expectations of their younger employed people or unemployed people, is a China that's going to be more closed, a China that's going to be less innovative, a China that's going to be less in positive exchange with the rest of the world. And we shouldn't forget that there's been a huge amount culturally in innovation, in business networks and human development that has come out of Chinese exchange in various forms, not just limited commercial forms with, with the U.S., but with the world at large. And we're moving in a direction where that's becoming less and less available. And that's partly things the U.S. and the West are doing and mostly things she is doing, but it's both. This is a loss. This is a loss for the hundreds of millions of people in China who want more options, more freedom. And it's a loss for the rest of us who don't get to benefit from that exchange. And I think we should look at it from that point of view. I agree. Um, I think we can all agree on that. Um, Ling Ling, I'm curious about um, whether you think there are um, options for Xi uh, that he could exercise in the coming months and how likely it is that he would be willing to listen to alternate points of view, um, alternate economic proposals uh, to fix uh, some of the problems we've been discussing. Is is he open to reversing course? Uh, thank you. Another great question. Well, China constantly surprises, so we can rule out anything or everything. So, um, but in order for China to really have a meaningful course correction on economic policy, the politics has to change. Uh, at the very highest level, um, the, the focus for the party, for the government has to change back to economic develop development, back on the path of reform and opening Deng Xiaoping, you know, um, uh, started. Um, for now, we're not seeing any signs of that happening. Uh, you know, down to more detailed policies, you know, we need the government to not just talk about supporting private sector. We need the government to actually making, taking specific measures to support the property sector, uh, to the private sector. 
And in terms of property sector, we need the government to really figure out, you know, have some follow through on their existing policies, you know, how really help the developers restructure debt and allow the losses to be allocated among different stakeholders. So, um, but, you know, for now, we're not seeing any signs of any meaningful course correction happening. The biggest reason for that is that, you know, Xi Jinping is very determined, right? Uh, for him, the biggest priority this, is this uh, great power competition with the United States and its allies and partners. Uh, to that end, he has many demands for the kind of resources China has now. You know, a lot of people have debated over how much uh, fiscal space China has uh, for stimulating the economy. You know, the answer really is not that much, you know, if you consider uh, Xi Jinping's other demands, other priorities, for example, defense spending, spending needed for surveillance, spending needed for Belt and Road and other related objectives, you know, um, all those, you know, things in order to, uh, you know, implement all these priorities, there really not much left for stimulating the economy. And one, um, a, another obvious policy tool China can use, but China hasn't, is, you know, handing out cash to households. Uh, like what the United States did during COVID. During COVID, one of the most um, well-known economists, uh, Liu Yuanchun, you know, in a very lengthy report, he really suggested the government should hand out a thousand renminbi uh, per household. You know, that may not sound much, but that would go a long way in terms of rebuilding confidence. That would make people feel like. Wow, the government still cares about the economy, still cares about, you know, development, and that will really help the government turn uh, the economy turn around. But so far, we haven't seen that happening. The focus for their economic policy right now is still letting the government play a central role in terms of, uh, you know, investment, especially in what they call you know, clean energy, you know, high end infrastructure, you know, digital infrastructure, et cetera. And the other uh, component is letting the government reallocating resources, right? Credit and other stuff into sectors that uh, the leadership thinks critical for China's future. Uh, AI, semiconductors, quantum computing, cloud computing, big data, because all of those things in Xi Jinping's view are crucial in terms of uh, trying to win this great power competition with the United States. So Thank James, you. speaking of uh, great power competition, uh, you're, you, you end up speaking with uh, policymakers in the White House quite often uh, on China policy. How are they seeing this? I mean, on the one hand, it could be an opportunity. On the other hand, uh, a Chinese sharp slowdown, potentially instability. These aren't great things for the world, as we've been discussing. So I haven't heard a lot of worry about instability. And in fact, I've heard some optimism that basically the slowdown puts a shrimp on some of the like um, on some of the ambitions. Like if you're dealing with problems at home, it's in some ways harder to sort of think of foreign adventurism and so on. Um, among the hardest core hawks, there's a sort of jubilation, to be honest. I mean, I remember talking with um, a three-letter agency guy um, years ago um, in uh, who was uh, in China um, at the at the embassy there, saying. And it, saying, you know, we should cripple them economically. Like there's been a there's there's been a desire among the hardest core hawks to to do that for a long time. And now that it's happening, and it's mostly not been America that's done it. It's mostly been self inflicted wounds. There's there's a real sense of sort of potential triumph. Um, but I think mostly, I think I would say the 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 default position is caution, just because once you get to that level and once you start to see the sort of intelligence and so on coming in you realize how little we know like even if you're even if you're seeing this you know like top level product of the u.s intelligence system the u.s security system we see such a tiny fragment of china we know so so little in many ways about what's happening in so many parts of the country on the ground and we've known less and less 
since China began closing its doors more. Um, and, you know, we've seen people like Ling Ling, I think, got forced out in 2020. Um, many other reporters, like people who were giving us like fantastic ground level insights um, have are gone. Uh, the ability to to see stuff through sort of provincial blogging and commentary and so on has been drastically reduced. Uh, the economic data is getting worse and worse. And so there's no, there's no sort of, um, there's a, there's a real, there's a real kind of, do we actually know what's happening question? Like how much do we know what's happening? But the thing is that question applies to the Chinese as well. Like, it's not like there's a hidden sec second set of books that contain all the real numbers in China. Um, there's everybody has their own different sets of numbers and estimates that they get through different through different means that they think approximate the real figures but the but um they're all kind of going through a lot of guesswork about what what the numbers actually are it's a telling state of affairs when two of the people i read frequently james and ling ling uh, are are telling us that uh it's hard to know what's going on on the ground um but adam i'm going to put the last question to you um in your writing um you've also made the the, the point that Washington can take advantage of a Chinese slowdown in certain respects. Uh, explain that. Yeah, and I want to stress, Ravi, thank you. I want to stress that take advantage in a very positive way, not in the triumphalism of some of the hawks that James rightly was referring to. I think what happens in these kinds of autocratic situations when the leader violates what I call the no politics, no problem compact is people start looking for the exits. Not everybody, not massive outflows, but wealthy people start trying to move their money out and when they can get their kids out. Um, companies start moving production abroad, trying to diversify, meaning Chinese companies and also producers in China. And obviously, U.S. foreign policies had something to do with that. Capital starts flowing out. This is part of why we're seeing the, the yuan be so weak against the dollar in recent months intellectual property. If the U.S. were to reorient its policies, as I put it for a bumper sticker, sticker towards suction, not sanctions, it would be to both our and the world's advantage because it's it, it essentially puts pressure on Xi and the Communist Party leadership to either accept that there's going to be outflows or they end up like their forebears, the autocrats in the Soviet Union and Latin America and elsewhere, putting up more barriers to try to stem the outflows, which we know then makes people more nervous and more eager to get around them. Um, this also emphasizes that our fight, to the degree we have a fight, certainly our challenge, is with the Chinese Communist Party, not because we have delusions we can take down the regime, but that it's with them, not with the people, not with private commerce. And then it's also better with allies because we're not trying to police them and how to behave vis-a-vis -vis China. We're trying to induce Chinese private sector to do its own adjustment. And the final point I would make as an economist is this is much better for the US economy and for the world economy than putting on the barriers and the tariffs. So mm -hmm. I would encourage and I've tried with less access than James to reach people in the Biden administration to rethink. This is the kind of strategy we used against the fascist regimes in the 30s. This is the kind of strategy we used against the Soviet regime. And to go with the important points you were just talking about, about perceptions, you should remember that we totally misperceived the economic strengths of the Soviet regime until very late in the 80s. We totally overestimated Japan in the 90s. You know, it's not that China's falling apart. None of us are saying it's collapsing, not, but there is much more weakness there than in the economic sphere that people realize. And so we should think about it in a different way.
欢迎大家收看《华尔街评论》。我们现在给大家播报的主要内容包括：审视最高法院即将审理的 Net Choice 案件，第一部分。下一任欧盟首脑将更需要资金，而不是贸易战。德国的新常态。以色列凸显了新贸易通道的脆弱性。香港收购使房地产困境变得一片混乱不清。等等，请大家收看。审视最高法院即将审理的 Net Choice 案件，第一部分。美国企业研究所，美国最高法院同意审查两个在社交媒体平台的第一修正案言论权利方面存在严重冲突的联邦法院裁决，分别是来自第十一巡回上诉法院的 Moody v Net Choice 案和第五巡回上诉法院的 Net Choice v Paxton 案。大法官们可能是在二零二四年六月将解决这些法院对于佛罗里达州和德克萨斯州类似法律的合宪性的争议。这些法律强迫平台违背自己的意愿托管内容和用户，并个别解释内容删除决定。Net Choice 案件中的问题在于，平台作为私营企业，自行决定以下事项的自由，而不受政府干预和强制：一、允许和禁止的内容类型；二、如何策划、展示和删除内容。三、何时封禁用户，以及如何向他们解释删除其内容的决定。平台的编辑控制权和自主权，以创建、维护和发展他们所期望的言论社区，而不是政府自以为是的认为可取的社区，正面临威胁。通过 Adobe Stock， 本文是一个两部分系列的第一部分，概述了最高法院将审查的问题和法规。第二篇文章将解释为什么最高法院决定审理这些案件，并指出一些法规、问题和概念。大法官们可能会在这些案件中简要或详细的讨论。这些主题包括：一、通信连接法第二百三十条款；二、不说话的第一修正案权利；三、最高法院在一九七四年详细阐述的社交媒体平台和印刷报纸的编辑权利之间的类比。四、评估佛罗里达州和德克萨斯州法规合宪性的可能审查标准，以及五、文本和历史在某些大法官身上可能发挥的作用。关于法律问题，最高法院接受了美国总检察长伊丽莎白·巴尔查斯·普雷洛加在八月提交的请愿书中敦促其考虑的两个问题。这些问题涉及佛罗里达州和德克萨斯州对大型社交媒体平台施加的内容审查限制和个别解释要求是否违反了平台的言论自由权利。换句话说，州法规强制表达和规定如何安排表达是否违反了第一修正案。第十一巡回上诉法院在二零二二年五月得出结论，认为佛罗里达州的两组要求内容审查和个别解释很可能违宪，确认了一项初步禁令阻止了他们的执行。相反，第五巡回上诉法院几个月后确定类似的德克萨斯州法规是合宪的，因为他们既不强迫也不阻碍平台自己的言论，因此他推翻了一项相反的初审法院决定。内容审查法规要求什么？他们强迫平台托管他们本来不会托管的内容和用户，同时干涉平台关于如何安排内容的编辑选择。例如，佛罗里达州的一项法规禁止大型社交媒体平台年度总收入超过一亿美元，或全球至少有一亿月度个人平台参与者在阳光州永久封禁或暂停超过十四天的合法合格的州或地方候选人。因此，候选人可以公然违反平台关于可接受内容的政策，例如 Facebook 对仇恨言论和特别暴力或血腥内容的禁止，而不必担心被踢出平台。违反该法规的州级候选人平台可能被罚款高达每天二十五万美元。另一项佛罗里达州法规干涉了平台关于如何安排用户的动态和搜索结果中与候选人有关的内容和材料的编辑判断。它通过禁止事前优先算法来实现这一点。这些算法通常有助于组织内容，就像报纸在纸张和页面上优先安排文章一样。根据同一法规，平台不能根据其出版物或广播的内容审查、封禁或阴影封禁新闻机构。该法规对写体字的术语进行了定义。德克萨斯州的一项法规禁止拥有超过五千万活跃阅读用户的平台，根据用户的观点或用户表达的观点审查用户、用户的表达或用户接收他人表达的能力。相关法规对审查做了一些例外规定，但不适用于性别歧视。种族歧视和反 LGBTQ 观点也不适用于宗教偏见，无论是反犹太人还是反天主教。平台不能删除这种毫无价值、充满仇恨的表达。
，除非这些帖子直接煽动犯罪活动或明确威胁暴力。佛罗里达州和德克萨斯州的个别解释要求共同要求平台向用户提供详尽、个性化的解释，解释为什么删除他们的内容。正如总检察长普雷洛加所断言的那样，平台进行的内容删除数量庞大，使得企业无法遵守这些要求。德克萨斯州还要求进行繁琐的上诉程序，另请参阅。第五巡回上诉法院突然改变对社交媒体审查的立场背后的原因是什么？被遗忘的私人权利的天才，立法透明度还是违宪的政府强制社交媒体审查？密苏里州诉拜登暗语政治、审查和言论自由的十字路口。本文是美国企业研究所 AEI 的最高法院即将审理 NetChoice 案件的回顾，第一部分的一部分。下一任欧盟首脑将更需要资金，而不是贸易战。路透观点：欧欧盟 EU 在寻求资助其经济增长和扩张计划时，面临重大预算挑战。仅乌克兰就需要 4,110 亿美元的重建资金，而欧盟估计在2027年之前的资金缺口为 1,100 亿欧元（ 1 2 8 0亿美元）。然而，欧盟目前的预算已经非常紧张，提高新的收入来源的提议也未能得到支持。欧盟下一任委员会主席将于二零二四年中旬选举产生，他需要解决这些预算问题，以确保欧盟项目的成功和稳定。欧盟还需要为转向更环保的经济体系提供资金，并与美国和中国在全球补贴竞赛中竞争。欧盟目前提出的增加收入的建议包括改革企业税收制度、取消航空和海运燃油征税的豁免。此外，如果欧盟希望进一步扩大，还需要与现有成员国就决策过程和资金达成新的协议。德国的新常态，外交事务。巴伐利亚和黑森州的地方选举显示，德国各地的极右翼和民粹主义情绪正在上升。极右翼的德国选择党 AFD 在这两个州都获得了显著的支持。该党在全国民意调查中的支持率约为上次全国选举中所获得选票的两倍。德国极右翼的崛起对其欧洲邻国尤为令人担忧，因为德国有着黑暗的二十世纪历史。AFD 的激进派赢得了一场激烈的内部斗争，毫不掩饰其极端观点。该党否认气候变化，希望将欧洲变成一个针对移民的堡垒，并对德国的代议制民主表示厌恶。AFD 的崛起分裂了德国的保守党，并引发了关于基督教民主联盟 CDU 身份的战略辩论。一些对默克尔总理持批评态度的人将 AFD 的崛起归咎于他在2015年欢迎叙利亚难民，并希望 CDU 关注 AFD 选民关心的问题，如移民和传统价值观。然而 ，CDU 的中间派认为，试图采纳极右翼立场是一种失败的策略，选民往往更喜欢原版，而不是稀释的替代品。德国的主流政党仍致力于阻止 AFD 获得严重权利。但极右翼的崛起已经在反对派中分裂了保守派，并限制了当前进步联盟的政治空间。为了应对 AFD 的崛起，奥拉夫·肖尔茨总理的政府需要重新赢得选民的信任，因为他们认为联合政府功能失调无效。这包括承认错误，如糟糕的公暖法，并结束政府的持续内斗。这已经使政府陷入瘫痪。政府和反对派都必须避免助长极化，从而增强 AFD 的力量。而是专注于保护德国民主免受其极端敌人的侵害。以色列凸显了新贸易通道的脆弱性。路透观点：以色列和巴勒斯坦之间持续不断的冲突，破坏了印度、中东、欧洲走廊 i n e c j 的计划。该贸易路线将通过沙特阿拉伯和以色列，将印度与欧洲连接起来。i m e c 旨在将航运时间缩短百分之四十，被世界各国领导人。包括美国总统乔·拜登和印度总理纳伦德拉·莫迪，视为一项重大基础设施项目。然而，该地区目前的暴力冲突使得沙特阿拉伯与以色列正常化关系变得冒险，而这是走廊能够完全运作的必要步骤。这场冲突还凸显了重新配置全球贸易和金融路线的挑战。香港收购使房地产困境变得一片混乱不清。路透观点。海通证券已经提出以百分之一百一十四的溢价收购其子公司海通国际证券集团剩余的股份，以补充其尚未拥有的股权。由于中国房地产公司的崩溃，包括 HNA 和恒大等客户 
，海通国际遭受了损失。子公司资产缺乏透明度，使得这笔交易无法为其他与中国房地产市场有关的券商设立一个基准。香港政府的 OACS 项目取得良好开端，吸引了三十家公司。南华早报评论版：香港吸引战略企业办公室 OACS 成功吸引了三十家公司，主要来自中国大陆。承诺创造一万个本地就业机会，并投资约三百亿港元（三十八亿美元）。OACS 成立不到一年，专注于吸引生命健康科学、人工智能、数据科学、金融科技、先进制造、新材料和新能源等领域的高潜力企业。这些公司将在北部都会区设立基地，该区紧邻深圳，并且是大湾区一体化计划的一部分。谈判解决是以色列哈马斯战争的唯一答案。南华早报评论版：最近，哈马斯对以色列的袭击导致了该国自七十五年前建国以来最致命的暴力事件，许多平民丧生。哈马斯声称在加沙地带扣押了大约一百三十名以色列人质。国际社会必须团结起来，呼吁立即停火，以防止进一步升级，并解决该地区长期存在的人道主义悲剧。袭击中的突然袭击引发了对以色列情报机构的质疑。尽管这些袭击受到了广泛谴责，但双方之间的暴力领土敌对行为使得很难将其定性为无端的。一些人怀疑哈马斯旨在破坏以色列与阿拉伯国家之间的潜在关系正常化，而这种关系得到了美国的支持。任何涉及其他国家的升级都可能对全球经济产生灾难性后果。以色列应该采取温和和外交的方式回应，而不是进行军事报复。作为地区和平调解者。中国应该在促进谈判和避免战队方面发挥作用，双方都必须冷静下来，启动政治谈判以寻求解决方案。中国的一带一路政策转变可能对较贫穷的国家造成最大冲击。南华早报评论版：中国的一带一路倡议在过去一年中面临了许多挑战，包括一带一路投资的下降和中国经济的放缓。此外，西方国家通过提供发展替代方案来加强与中国倡议的竞争。中国对该倡议的目标也发生了变化，重点放在更小、更有针对性的项目上，特别是在印度太平洋地区。即将举行的第三届“一带一路”国际合作高峰论坛预计将强调增加倡议六个走廊之间的连通性。发展中国家可能会承受中国战略转变的主要压力。围困加沙并不是解决办法。外交政策，以色列军队目前正在对加沙地带进行轰炸。以色列总理本雅明·内塔尼亚胡在哈马斯组织和其他巴勒斯坦武装分子发动大规模袭击后，宣布对哈马斯宣战。这次最新的袭击是一种常态。自2006年以来，以色列每两年就会在加沙地带进行大规模军事行动。尽管以色列采取了大量措施对该地区进行监视，包括高科技导弹拦截器。墙壁、围栏和地下隧道探测器，但哈马斯仍然能够发动重大袭击。以色列一再未能削弱巴勒斯坦武装分子的能力，每次袭击都导致巴勒斯坦平民死亡。然而，内塔尼亚胡很可能会继续采取这种军事化的方法。国际社会在很大程度上支持以色列的行动。巴勒斯坦人的人权状况已经大幅恶化，以色列的暴力行为近年来达到了前所未有的水平。以色列政治家现在公开呼吁对巴勒斯坦人进行种族清洗，国际社会必须紧急采取行动，以防止进一步的暴行和战争罪行。但迄今为止，西方官员在很大程度上支持以色列的行动。哈马斯的袭击改变了一切。外交政策：最近，以色列和哈马斯之间的冲突改变了该地区的动态，使沙特与以色列的正常化等问题被搁置。这场冲突清楚地表明，巴勒斯坦问题不仅仅是正常化道路上的一个选项，而是需要解决的关键问题。只要巴勒斯坦人的不满得不到解决，阿拉伯国家将无法推进正常化进程。这场冲突还凸显了哈马斯面临的问题不仅仅是对约旦河西岸和加沙地带的占领，而是以色列本身的存在。如果没有为巴勒斯坦人争取正义，支持正常化的力量将非常薄弱。此外，这场冲突也对与伊朗的外交接触是否会导致行为变化的假设提出了质疑。有迹象表明，伊朗可能在支持哈马斯最近对以色列的渗透行动中发挥了作用。
，这表明伊朗的目标是破坏地区秩序并对抗以色列。这场冲突还引发了对加沙地带未来的问题。尽管以色列之前曾努力摆脱对该地区的占领，但他们可能会再次发现自己占领该地区，这很可能会阻碍正常化努力，并对该地区产生更广泛的影响。各位观众朋友，大家好，我是六博士。来自六度世界，是你们每周的观察员。今天我要和大家分享几则新闻，包括美国最高法院即将审理的 Net Choice 案件，欧盟面临的预算挑战，德国及右翼崛起，以色列和哈马斯的冲突，以及中国“一带一路”政策的转变。首先，让我们来谈谈 Net Choice 案件。这个案件涉及到社交媒体平台的言论自由和政府干预的问题。最高法院将审理这个案件。解决佛罗里达州和德克萨斯州的法律是否违宪的争议。这些法律要求社交媒体平台违背自己的意愿托管内容和用户，并个别解释删除内容的决定。但是，这样的法律可能威胁到平台的编辑控制权和自主权，限制了他们创建、维护和发展所期望的言论社区的能力。接下来，让我们转向欧盟面临的预算挑战。欧盟需要资金来支持经济增长和扩张计划，但目前的预算已经非常紧张，提高新的收入来源的提议也未能得到支持，这将对欧盟的项目成功和稳定造成问题。欧盟下一任委员会主席将需要解决这些预算问题，确保欧盟能够继续顺利运行。再来，让我们看看德国极右翼的崛起。最近德国的地方选举显示。德国各地的极右翼和民粹主义情绪正在上升，这对德国的欧洲邻国尤其令人担忧，因为德国有着黑暗的二十世纪历史。德国极右翼的崛起对其政党和社会带来了分裂，并限制了政治空间。为了应对这个问题，德国政府需要重新赢得选民的信任，并采取措施解决人们的不满。接下来，让我们来谈谈以色列和哈马斯的冲突。最近的冲突使该地区的局势变得更加动荡不安。国际社会应该团结起来，呼吁立即停火，并解决该地区的人道主义悲剧。我们希望双方能够冷静下来，并开始政治谈判，寻求解决方案。最后，让我们谈谈中国“一带一路”政策的转变。中国的“一带一路”倡议在过去一年中面临了许多挑战，包括投资下降和经济放缓。中国对该倡议的目标也发生了变化，重点放在更小、更有针对性的项目上。发展中国家可能会承受这个转变的主要压力。以上是我对这些新闻的简要分析和观点。现在我想邀请大家一起来参与讨论，你有什么样的想法？谢谢您的收看。上面播报的内容是六度团队推荐的全球专业媒体、智库、政府机构和行业专家的最新报道、分析简报。更详细的内容，请大家去这些媒体、智库的网站阅读。这些内容并不一定反映六度简报的立场，亦不能作为任何决策的建议。六度团队由专业媒体人、学者、科学家组成的独立新型媒体，大家可以根据自己的专业要求订阅各种简报，网址是六度 brief com。您在世界任何地方都可以通过电邮收到六度简报。欢迎大家收看《华尔街电视简报》。我们现在给大家播报的主要内容包括：国际货币基金组织表示，全球经济衰退的担忧是没有根据的；国际货币基金组织认为，全球经济更有可能实现软着陆；国际货币基金组织下调了对中国经济增长的预测，因为世界经济出现分化，是时候让泰国的新政府言行一致，进行改革了。马克·卡尼可能会成为一位出色的首相。下一个是谁？以及其他十月十日的读者来信，等等，请大家收看。国际货币基金组织表示，全球经济衰退的担忧是没有根据的。卫报，国际货币基金组织 （IMF） 表示，由乌克兰战争和生活成本危机引发的全球经济衰退的担忧是没有根据的，因为近年来经济增长表现出了显著的韧性。IMF 更新了其世界经济展望报告，指出全球经济增长预计从2022年的 3.5% 下降至今年的 3% 并在2024年降至 2.9% 预计英国将成为七国集团 G7 中除德国外经济增长最弱的国家。
并在2024年以 0.6% 的增长率排名垫底。国际货币基金组织认为，全球经济更有可能实现软着陆。CNN 国际货币基金组织 IMF 警告称。尽管中央银行在不引发全球经济衰退的情况下更有可能控制通胀，但经济增长仍然疲软且不稳定。IMF 将今年全球增长预测维持在 3% 但将2024年的增长预测下调至 2.9% 该机构表示，全球经济艰难前行，风险向下倾斜。IMF 还警告称，通胀将继续下降，但在大多数情况下。直到二零二五年才能恢复到中央银行的目标水平。国际货币基金组织下调了对中国经济增长的预测，因为世界经济出现分化。日经亚洲，国际货币基金组织 （IMF） 下调了对中国经济在二零二三年和二零二四年的增长预测。IMF 表示，中国的房地产危机以及消费者和企业信心的疲软，对全球经济构成了重大风险。IMF 现在预计，中国经济今年将增长 5%2024 年将增长 4.2% 分别比其7月份的先前预测下调了 0.1 和 0.2 个百分点。IMF 还警告称，中国的房地产危机可能会加剧，并对全球商品出口国造成溢出效应。是时候让泰国的新政府言行一致，进行改革了。日经亚洲。泰国总理 s r e s a s a v i s o n 是一位前房地产大亨，他面临着重振受 COVID-19 疫情严重打击的国家经济的压力。政府已宣布一系列经济刺激措施，包括向每位16岁或以上的泰国人发放1万泰铢271美元的数字现金补贴。然而，人们担心刺激措施将如何资助，以及政府是否会解决重要的结构性问题。为了实现政府雄心勃勃的 5% 年度经济增长目标。泰国需要吸引更多外国直接投资，并实施全面的改革。马克·卡尼可能会成为一位出色的首相。下一个是谁？以及其他十月十日的读者来信。加拿大《环球邮报》，《环球邮报》的读者对最近的文章发表了各种不同的观点。一位读者认为，前加拿大和英国央行行长马克·卡尼将成为一位出色的总理，但在加拿大选举制度下可能会遇到困难。另一位读者赞扬该报揭露政府腐败的努力，而第三位读者则强调地方政府的保密性。另一位读者认为，保守派对变革感到不适，因此难以解决复杂问题。而第五位读者则认为，自由党议员 t e n s u 不应被忽视作为密西沙加市市长候选人。第六位读者质疑跨山书有管道三百亿美元的成本。并建议这笔钱可以更好的用于绿色倡议、医疗改革和解决经济适用房问题。最后，另外两位读者讨论了利率上调的影响以及保护生物多样性的重要性。由于以色列哈马斯战争，全球石油价格会继续上涨吗？半岛电视台，油价上涨，人们担心以色列和哈马斯之间的冲突会对中东能源生产产生影响。虽然以色列和加沙都不是主要的石油生产国，但市场担心这场冲突可能导致更广泛的地区不稳定，对能源价格的直接影响可能有限。但如果冲突蔓延到其他国家，石油供应可能面临更大风险。需要关注的因素包括冲突是否牵涉到伊朗或真主党，以及是否有证据显示伊朗参与了哈马斯的袭击，这可能导致美国对伊朗能源实施进一步制裁。伦敦股市反弹。英国债收益率回落。路透社，周二，英国股市出现反弹，因美联储官员鸽派言论导致美国国债收益率回落，抵消了中东冲突的担忧。国际化的富时一百指数上涨了百分之零点九，而更多关注国内市场的富时二百五十指数上涨了百分之零点六。贵金属矿商股价上涨了百分之零点八，因黄金价格上涨。受到以色列和巴勒斯坦伊斯兰组织哈马斯之间冲突导致的市场不确定性的影响，美联储高层官员的鸽派言论对美元和国债收益率产生了压力，表明美国长期国债收益率上升可能会使美联储放缓其短期政策利率的进一步提高。工业金属矿商股价也上涨了百分之零点六，因铜价上涨。九月份，由于对利率的担忧，外资流出冲击了亚洲股市。路透社，九月份
亚洲股市出现大规模的外资流出，原因是对美国的高利率和国债收益率激增表示担忧。来自台湾、印度、韩国、印度尼西亚、菲律宾、泰国和越南的证券交易所的数据显示，外国投资者在上个月抛售了价值 112.6 亿美元的地区股票，这是自2022年6月以来的最大流出。美联储在9月份维持了利率不变。但预计年底会加息，引发了对紧缩货币政策以应对通胀压力的担忧。MSCI 亚太指数在九月份下跌了百分之二点九，并创下了六个月来的最低点。各位观众朋友们，大家好，我是来自六度世界的六博士，是您每周为您带来六度简报的观察员。在本期的新闻中，我们看到了国际货币基金组织 IMF 对全球经济的评估和预测。IMF 表示。全球经济衰退的担忧是没有根据的，并认为全球经济更有可能实现软着陆。然而，他们也指出了一些风险和挑战，例如通胀和中国经济增长下调的问题。同时，我们还关注到泰国新政府和加拿大政治局势的发展。泰国新政府面临着振兴经济、吸引外国投资和实施改革的压力。至于加拿大，读者们对政府的表现和未来发展提出了各种不同的观点和问题。此外，我们还关注到中东地区局势对全球石油价格的影响，以及英国股市和亚洲股市受到的外资流出的冲击。总的来说，这些新闻提醒我们，经济和政治都是充满变数和风险的。我们需要时刻关注世界的变化，以便做出明智的决策。现在，我邀请各位观众朋友们一起参与讨论。你有什么样的想法？你对这些新闻有什么看法和疑问？请留言和我们分享，我们将一起探讨这些问题。谢谢收看，我是六博士，下次见。谢谢您的收看。上面播报的内容是六度团队推荐的全球专业媒体、智库、政府机构和行业专家的最新报道、分析简报。更详细的内容，请大家去这些媒体、智库的网站阅读。这些内容并不一定反映六度简报的立场，亦不能作为任何决策的建议。六度团队由专业媒体人、学者、科学家组成的独立新型媒体，大家可以根据自己的专业要求订阅各种简报，网址是六度 brief com。您在世界任何地方都可以通过电邮收到六度简报。Hello， 大家好，欢迎关注华尔街电视频道。这期的热点深度关注中国深圳处理北极鲶鱼事件的结果。在10月10日，深圳市的纪委监委发布消息，宣布开除深圳市原交通局货运管理分局局长钟根次的中共党籍待遇降级。通告提到，钟根次对党不忠诚、不老实，多次串供对抗组织审查，借机敛财。违规从事盈利的活动，未经批准，违规兼职，利用职务便利为他人谋取利益，非法收受他人财物，经决定给予开除党籍，收交违法所得，按二级科员的确定期退休待遇。那根据媒体的报道，这位中根次正是此前北极鲶鱼炫富事件的主角，网名 ID 为“北极鲶鱼的爷爷”。那还是先来回顾一下北极鲶鱼事件的前因后果。这是一场炫富引发的一个全民调查。在2023年的3月，微博昵称这个微博新浪微博昵称为“北极鲶鱼”的网网友，在网络上炫富，侮辱网民，还称自己的爷爷呢是前深圳交通运输局的局长，家中存款达到九位数，多次使用“支那”等。侮辱反驳他的网民，该网民呢还是晒出家中长辈多年前与领导的合影，这被质疑是炫富、家中设贪腐等问题。再加上他发布微博的时候 ，IP 上显示为澳大利亚，事件随后是在网络上发酵。在二零三月二十四日，深圳交通运输局发布了通报，称啊将会调查这整起事件。在二零二三年的三月二十四日，中根次回应了《中国新闻周刊》这家媒体，称啊家中有九位数的说法不实，表示自己二零零七年就已经退休，曾任深圳区级交通局局长。他说自己是老老实实就这样干到退休
，目前相关单位正在介入调查。在二零二三年的三月二十四日，深圳市交通运输局发布情况通报，证实北极鲶鱼的祖父，也就是爷爷，就是该局原货运分局干部钟根次。且中根次已于二零零七年十一月三十日退休。该局将就相关信息开展核查，及时通报有关的情况。那自深圳市交通运输局三月发布情况通报之后，中国的大大小小的媒体是多次致电该局询问相应的调查进展。有媒体在八月份就询问深圳市纪委建委该事件调查进展，得到的回复是：后续情况等待通知。在九月十日的时候，人民网深圳频道在深这个社交平台发布的深圳市交通运输局的文件就显示，有网友在八月向该局申请北极鲶鱼事件信息公开，深圳市交通局则回应说，所申请的信息，这个所申请公开的信息呢，不属于公开法定的公开内容，决定是不予公开。在中国官媒中新社微博一条。国事直通车在二零二三年三月这个九月十五日发表评论文章，就质问该事件从及时通报变成了不予公开，那到底是有难言之隐，还是另有猫腻？文章呼吁此次事件需要给公众一个更加详细、更加正面回应问题的通报。中新社在微博发起的投票调查显示，有超过九成的网民认为这个北极鲶鱼事件应公布结果。尽管有媒体引述法律人士解释，网民以申请政府信息信息公开的形式向深圳市交通局申请公开北极鲶鱼事件的调查结果是用错了方法，因为公务员是否违纪的调查信息的确不属于政府信息。但在重重的压力之下，深圳市交通局的工作人员在9月14日回应媒体时改口口风。承诺是具体的处理结果将会在十五个工作日进行回复。那接下来就是这个漫长的倒数计时，在网民和媒体的共同倒数中，深圳市的纪委监委在十月十日，也就是九月十四日后的第十五个工作日，终于是发布了上述的处理结果。那公开资料显示，这个中根次，一九四七年十一月生，是深圳保安人，大专学历。历任深圳市原运输局福田分局的副局长、局长，深圳市原运输局罗湖分局局长，深圳市原交通局货运管理分局局长，在二零零七年十一月退休。而北极鲶鱼的微博言论，其实不只是单纯的炫富和炫耀特权，他还用挑衅、涉嫌辱华的字眼呢，是直接挑衅广大的网民，践踏网民的尊严及其。这个扭曲的价值观是直接在网络上进行宣扬。他在微博中是高调晒出自己的爷爷二三十年前公派出国，说啊和他的正师级好友以及市局的领导的合照，并在这个括弧里注明还有一个交通部长膜拜大佬。他发布的另一组爷爷出国的老照片中还写道说，穿西装公派美国变华尔街之狼，脸上写着四个字，感觉瘫了。而当他在微博表明自己已经是润到了澳大利亚之后啊，有网民问询为何润了还喜欢上中国的微博，北极鲶鱼则回复说：“那么多钱都是韭菜供的，我怎么能不喜欢呢？我只知道我家有九位数，想在哪个国家就在哪个国家。”北极鲶鱼还说：“我爷爷当交通局局长的时候，你爷爷还在给人修脚吧？”并回怼网民说：“就喜欢看你们知性难改的样子。”天天在网上气得跺脚，直来直去的，直直作响。这样，北极鲶鱼的言论暴露出了中国官员后代们在享受家族红利的同时，却对自己的国家充满这个恶意，对自己的这个同胞充满鄙夷以及拜高踩低的一种面目。这大概也是为什么中国网民时隔半年多啊，仍然是紧追北极鲶鱼不放，对它紧盯不放，直到十月十日，官方做出了一个交代。但很显然，对于上述的这个经决定给予开除党籍、收缴违法所得、按二级科员确定其退休待遇这样的处罚，有大多数的网民都觉得这处罚实在是太轻了。中根次被官宣开除中共党籍之后啊，微博当天有一项调查显示，有九成以上的网民认为这样的处罚实属过轻。
，知其违法了还能继续享受退休待遇啊，让普通人觉得有一点点不可思议。许多网民也注意到，和中根次一起被深圳市纪委监委通报的，还有深圳市这个深圳市的另外一位官员。那么他们在看中根次被通报之余，还发现。深圳市交通运输局的原党组副书记、市轨道交通建设指挥部的办公室原主任李福明也被通报。那五十九岁的李福明不仅被开除中共党籍和公职，还被移送检察机关审查、起诉，等待法律的制裁。网民也对有关中根次的通报中没有提及法律程序展开了一番讨论，就是说，哎，这个虽然是开除党籍变成了二级科员，那。有没有任何法律程序正在针对中根次正在进行中呢？哎，这份通报里是没有说的。那北极鲶鱼的爷爷或不会被起诉判刑，在十月十日当天的这个北京时间的下午也是冲上了微博热搜。对于处罚争议啊，中国官媒人民网在十月十日发表了题为《鲶鱼终于带出大鱼》的文章，里面说啊，这是民意的一种呈现，至于会不会继续被深挖，值得观察。文章同时还说啊，中根次落马有一定的偶然性，但北极鲶鱼事件发生之后，中根次被查却有必然性。北极鲶鱼一不小心为反腐立功，凭实力将自己的爷爷拉下马。中国官员前这个后代是前赴后继的，在社交媒体上，有的是暴露自家贪腐问题，有的是暴露自家的这个财富啊来源可疑的问题，而且几乎是一查一个准。网民们自然希望越来越多。类似的事件，把贪官一个个给揪出来。有网民就在网上留言说：“啊，反腐永远在路上啊，也可以在家里。”但这种反腐模式的后坐力也非常的强。在北京鲶鱼事件中，民众直观的感受到一个官员后代的腐败生活和不可一世的傲慢，这无疑啊也会进一步加剧官民以及贫富阶层之间的矛盾冲突。啊，有人就说啊，本来家里啊催促自己考要考这个公务员。一直觉得不能理解，但借助着这个北极鲶鱼以及北极鲶鲶鱼爷爷事件，这样的一个九位数也仅仅是被开除党籍，还能保留一个二级科员的退休待遇啊，也是想有了这个呃下决心去考公务员的冲动。而深圳交通局这边，他们的被动态度也消耗了当地政府机关的公信力，也让网民们网民们对于社会财富分配不公的。不满的情绪是持续发酵，增加了社会的不稳定。而从过去的三小三举报到近来的这个红二代、红三代、红四代，甚至拿石头砸自己的脚，其实本质呢都是非制度性的事后反腐。更具成效的制度性反腐，应从防止腐败上下功夫，或至少从加强事前预警机制着手，才能走出一个啊我们看到的一查一个准的怪圈。好了，以上就是今天热点深度的所有内容。更多资讯可以关注六度简报网，网址是六度 brief dot com。在上面，各位可以订阅各类符合您喜好的简报新闻，有免费套餐，也有更加专业的付费套餐供大家选择。今天的视频就到这里，我们下个节目再见。欢迎大家收看《华尔街电视简报》，我们现在给大家。播报的主要内容包括：喜应该知道为什么市场信心没有恢复。联邦储备银行总裁卡什卡里，软着陆在望，但风险仍然存在。ASX 预计在利率乐观情绪推动下上涨，石油下跌。独家：国际货币基金组织认为可以增加资金支持，而无需改变股权分配。以色列政府寻求为航空公司提供可能的战争风险保险的保障。等等，请大家收看。喜应该知道为什么市场信心没有恢复。日经亚洲，中国国家主席习近平面临一个两难选择，因为改善的经济数据未能安抚国际投资者的紧张情绪。过去，中国刺激经济增长的举措很快恢复了市场信心，之前的经历导致上证指数反弹，人民币稳定。然而，这一次。工厂活动改善的迹象和通缩压力的缓解，并没有让国际资金感到欣慰。北京方面稳定房地产市场和提振家庭需求的努力，也未能达到预期效果。因此，中国正经历多年来最严重的资本外流。
，外国投资者在七月至九月期间净抛售了八百零一亿元人民币、一百二十六亿美元的中国内地股票。恒生指数也低于今年一月份的水平，当时中国因为抗击新冠疫情而成为头条新闻。联邦储备银行总裁卡什卡里，软着陆在望，但风险仍然存在。路透社。明尼阿波利斯联邦储备银行行长尼尔·卡什卡里认为，美国经济正朝着软着陆的方向发展，即通胀回落至美联储的 2% 目标，而失业率不会急剧上升。卡什卡里表示，迄今为止，就业市场和经济对美联储的加息措施表现得比预期更为坚韧。然而，他警告称，如果经济保持强劲，美联储可能需要进一步加息以放缓经济增长，这可能导致更为严重的着陆。卡什卡里强调，现在宣布胜利还为时过早。ASX 预计在利率乐观情绪推动下上涨，石油下跌。悉尼先驱晨报预计澳大利亚股市将在华尔街积极交易后开盘。标普五百指数和纳斯达克指数在美联储官员表示，央行可能停止进一步加息后，达到三周高点。澳交所期货上涨 0.5% 达到 7,108 点。澳元对美元保持稳定在 64.22 美分。十年期国债收益率也从16年高点下降，表明债券收益率下降。然而，由于中东冲突和对美国潜在衰退的担忧，投资者仍然谨慎。独家，国际货币基金组织认为可以增加资金支持，而无需改变股权分配。路透社。国际货币基金组织 （IMF） 在最近在摩洛哥举行的会议上得到了对增加配额贷款资源的美国支持，而不改变其股权结构的重要支持。然而 ，IMF 总裁克里斯塔利娜·乔尔基耶娃表示，他希望设定一个截止日期，以便必要的重新调整危机贷款机构的股权结构，以反映较大新兴市场经济体的增长。以色列政府寻求为航空公司提供可能的战争风险保险的保障。路透社：以色列国会财政委员会将就为以色列航空公司批准国家担保的战争风险保险进行辩论。保险公司为以色列航空公司、以色列航空和阿尔及亚提供保险，并表示他们有权在以色列与哈马斯爆发战争的通知后的七天内取消保险政策。政府要求提供五十亿美元的国家担保，以支付战争风险保险的义务和费用，以维持航班。以色列的三家航空公司仍在运营，并增加了航班以接回滞留的以色列人。政治简报：加拿大皇家骑警对安大略省绿地转让展开调查。加拿大环球邮报：据警方的声明，加拿大皇家骑警已对安大略省政府的绿地土地交换展开调查。该案件是由安大略省警察局转交给他们的。去年，该省为了在2031年之前建造150万套住房，从受保护的绿地中移除了土地。两名立法监察员此前曾发现，从绿地中选择移除土地的过程存在缺陷，并偏袒某些开发商。省长道格·福特已经道歉，并在9月表示，这些土地将被归还给绿地。福特的办公室表示，他们将全力配合任何调查。家园稳定在八天高位，债券收益率下降。加拿大环球邮报，周二，由于美联储政策制定者的鸽派言论，家园对美元保持稳定，接近一周来的最高水平。亚特兰大联邦储备银行行长拉斐尔·博斯蒂克表示，美国央行不需要进一步提高利率，这导致华尔街上涨，美元对其他主要货币走弱。家园对投资者情绪的变化非常敏感，因为加拿大是主要的大宗商品生产国，包括石油。家园还得到了加拿大就业数据强于预期的支持。然而，根据美国商品期货交易委员会的数据，投机者对家园的看空压住增加了。加拿大债券收益率也在美国国债走低的影响下，呈现出平坦曲线的走势。恒大已成为中国债务驱动的房地产危机的典型代表。如果恒大破产，澳大利亚会注意到吗？澳洲 ABC， 澳大利亚储备银行 RBA 警告称，中国房地产市场面临严重恶化，可能导致中国内部金融压力加大，并影响与澳大利亚的贸易。RBA 最新的金融稳定性审查指出了中国金融体系存在的脆弱性，特别强调了房地产行业的风险。
，中国房地产市场占据了该国经济增长的约百分之三十。RBA 警告称，房地产行业的问题可能导致全球经济放缓、大宗商品价格下跌，以及中国对澳大利亚商品和服务的进口减少。中国的主要房地产开发商，包括恒大，面临重大挑战。恒大欠投资者超过三千亿美元，已经错过了偿还债务的最后期限，并面临高管涉嫌犯罪的指控。RBA 指出，尽管中国金融体系与发达经济体银行系统之间的直接联系有限，但澳大利亚不会免于受到影响。中国的金融压力可能导致全球经济活动放缓、大宗商品价格下跌，以及中国对澳大利亚商品和服务的进口减少。各位观众朋友们，大家好。我是来自六度世界的六博士，是常驻六度简报的观察员。今天我们要谈谈几个国际经济新闻，看看这些事件对全球经济的影响。首先，我们看到中国国家主席习近平面临一个两难选择。尽管中国经济数据有所改善，但国际投资者的信心并未恢复。过去，中国的刺激措施通常能够迅速恢复市场信心，但这一次却未能达到预期效果。中国正经历多年来最严重的资本外流，这对中国经济来说是个巨大的挑战。接下来，我们看到美国联邦储备银行总裁卡什卡里认为，美国经济正在朝着软着陆的方向发展。尽管就业市场和经济表现的比预期更为坚韧，但卡什卡里警告称，如果经济保持强劲，美联储可能需要进一步加息以放缓经济增长，这可能导致更为严重的着陆。在澳大利亚。股市预计将在利率乐观情绪的推动下上涨。然而，由于中东冲突和对美国潜在衰退的担忧，投资者仍然谨慎。国际货币基金组织在最近的会议上得到了美国对增加配额贷款资源的支持，而不改变其股权结构。然而 ，IMF 总裁乔尔基耶娃表示，他希望设定一个截止日期。以便必要的重新调整危机贷款机构的股权结构，以反映较大新兴市场经济体的增长。在中东地区，以色列政府正在寻求为航空公司提供可能的战争风险保险的保障，这反映了该地区的不稳定局势对航空业的影响。在加拿大，警方正在调查安大略省政府的绿地土地转让案件，这引发了对政府处理土地交换的公正性的质疑。最后，我们注意到，澳大利亚储备银行警告称，中国房地产市场面临严重恶化的风险，可能对与澳大利亚的贸易产生影响。中国的金融压力可能导致全球经济放缓、大宗商品价格下跌，以及中国对澳大利亚商品和服务的进口减少。综上所述，当前全球经济面临着许多挑战和不确定性，各国政府和央行需要密切关注经济形势。并及时采取措施来稳定市场和促进经济增长。同时，我们作为观众也应该关注这些事件的发展，并思考对我们个人和社会的影响。你有什么样的想法呢？欢迎大家参与讨论并提问。谢谢。本文仅代表个人观点，不构成投资建议。谢谢您的收看。上面播报的内容是六度团队推荐的全球专业媒体、智库。政府机构和行业专家的最新报道、分析简报，更详细的内容，请大家去这些媒体、智库的网站阅读。这些内容并不一定反映六度简报的立场，亦不能作为任何决策的建议。六度团队由专业媒体人、学者、科学家组成的独立新型媒体，大家可以根据自己的专业要求订阅各种简报。网址是六度 brief com。您在世界任何地方都可以通过电邮收到六度简报。大家好，我是华尔街电视的小安，为大家主持一档新的节目《亚洲大眼睛》。什么样的内容，您慢慢看就知道了。根据富时新闻报道，印度马哈拉斯特拉邦一家医院日前传出令人不胜唏嘘的悲剧事件，短短二十四小时内有多达二十四名患者死亡，包括十二名的新生儿。震惊社会及政界，反对派纷纷指责地方政府及院方疏忽过失，掀起一场政治风暴。根据了解，政府相关单位已经介入并调查该起事件。其中一名新生儿的家属尤格胜就指控，该间医院的新生儿病房非常拥挤，自己亲眼目睹一个保温箱竟然塞着五名婴儿。消息曝光后，引发外界哗然。
纷纷质疑该间医院医疗资源缺乏。对此，医院院长西亚姆劳则反驳：“医院的药物和医师是充足的，对新生儿都有提供照顾。”强调是因为患者本身对治疗没有反应才上命。印度最大反对派领袖拉胡尔甘蒂指责政府在宣传上花费了数亿卢比，却没有在儿童药物上投入任何资金。反对派政治人物纷纷指责总理莫迪为首的印度人民党及盟友领导的帮政府有严重疏忽，才导致婴儿集体死亡。最大反对党国民大会党主席就发文痛批印度人民党花了数千卢比宣传，却没钱买药给婴儿。事实上，这已经是该邦近月来第二起的类似事件。塔纳地区一家公立医院八月底也曾有十八名患者在一天内死亡。印度公共医疗系统人力设备严重不足。世界卫生组织 （WHO） 数据就显示，一病比为零点七比一千，远低于世卫建议的一比一千。印度全民免费医疗，那印度是全球最大的免费医疗体系之一。该体系覆盖了全国百分之九十的人口，为民众提供了基本的医疗服务。根据印度宪法，所有印度人都享有公立医院接受免费医疗的权利。印度人的预期寿命从不到三十三岁暴涨到现在的六十九岁，这在医疗救助上达到了相对公平的水平。根据世界卫生组织对全球190多个国家卫生筹资与分配公平性调查的结果，印度高居榜单上的第43名，比中国还要高。这意味着印度在医疗救助方面的投入和分配是相对公平的。网易号上有文章就指出，世界上没有免费的午餐。印度政府实行免费医疗，意味着政府需要巨额的财政支出。但是诡异的是，印度政府的医疗支出在世界上处于下游的水平，比巴基斯坦还要低。那印度如何实现医疗救助公平呢？印度的免费医疗包括了一药品免费。印度政府提供免费的基本药品，包括抗生素、退烧药、止痛药等等。而这些药品是由印度政府的药品管理局统一采购，然后通过医院或药店免费提供给民众。二、基本医疗检查免费。印度政府提供免费的基本医疗检查，包括身高、体重、血压、心电图、B 超、X 光等检查项目。这些检查由印度政府公共卫生机构或社区卫生中心提供。民众可以在当地的医疗机构免费进行检查。三、免费手术，印度政府提供免费的基本手术项目，包括阑尾炎手术、疝气手术、扁桃体切除手术等等。这些手术由印度政府的公立医院或私立医院提供，民众可以在这些医院免费进行手术。四、免费医疗咨询。印度政府提供免费的医疗咨询服务，民众可以向公共卫生机构或社区卫生中心的医生咨询自己的健康问题，获得医疗建议和治疗方案。五、免费医疗转介。那印度政府提供免费的医疗转介服务，如果民众需要进一步的医疗检查或治疗，公共卫生机构或社区卫生中心的医生会帮助民众转介到合适的医院或医生。看似这些免费医疗项目的设施，为印度民众提供了更加便利和优质的医疗服务，促进了印度的医疗卫生事业的发展。然而，免费医疗项目的实施也面临着一些挑战，如资源短缺、人员不足、管理不善等问题。印度政府需要继续加大投入，完善管理，提高医疗服务的质量和效率。印度医疗问题。那首先就是资源短缺。印度的免费医疗项目曾经备受世界卫生组织的赞誉，但是世界卫生组织早前却发布了一份报告，揭示了印度免费医疗项目的问题。根据世界卫生组织2017年的一份调查，全世界国家看病自掏腰包的比例平均约为 18%。然而，在免费医疗的印度，这一比例直线上升到 67%。虽然印度政府提供了免费的挂号费用，但是真正的大头药费却让印度普通家庭苦不堪言。印度政府提供的免费药品只限于一些基本的药品，对于癌症等真正可怕的病症，免费用药可以说是不可能的。过去三十年间，印度公立医院为病人提供免费药物的比例下降了近二十二个百分点，接近九成的药物需要自掏腰包。要么公立医院压根不提供，只能跑到其他价格昂贵的私立医院购买。
很多贫穷的印度家庭无法承受昂贵的药费，只能眼睁睁地看着亲人病重甚至死亡。第二大问题是人员不足。印度实施免费医疗政策，但由于免费医疗仅限于公立医院，这导致公立医院人满为患，医生比例到达了一比一千五百。在印度的一些大城市里，例如德里、孟买和班加罗尔，只有一家公立医院，但有数百万人的人口，公立医院常常出现几百人围绕着门诊的情况。即使是免费的，要获得治疗也是非常困难的。然而，在无法应付所有病人的情况下，印度只好开放私立医院。自从1990年公立医院开始入不敷出，医疗系统趁机推动私有化。私立医院是由私人投资建设和营运的，在医疗资源和条件上比公立医院更有优势。私立医院的医生和设备更好，医疗技术和服务质量也更高，因此更容易获得患者的信任和支持。然而，私立医院的发展也给印度医疗体系带来了很多问题。由于私立医院采用的是商业化经营模式，因此价格高昂，一般民众难以承受。此外，私立医院之间也存在着严重的竞争，一些不良商家为了获得更多的患者，甚至会采取不正当的手段，例如提供虚假宣传、误导患者、延误治疗等等，这对患者的健康和安全带来了极大的威胁。印度政府也认识到了私立医院带来的问题，并且采取了一系列措施来促进公立医院的发展和改革。政府已经推出了多项计划，例如扩建公立医院、提高医生和护士的工资待遇、改善医疗设备等等，以提高公立医院的服务质量和效率。印度政府还加强了对私立医院的监管，打击虚假宣传、不正当竞争等行为，以保障患者的权益和利益。总的来说，印度的免费医疗项目虽然给民众提供了一定的医疗保障，但由于限制于公立医院，导致资源短缺和分配不均，私立医院的发展也存在很多问题。医德问题，尽管印度政府推行了免费医疗项目，但是由于医疗资源分配不均和私立医院的兴起，许多印度人民无法承受高昂的药费和治疗费用，甚至导致家庭破产。有些医生为了个人利益，会给病人开一些昂贵的药物，甚至是没有必要的药物，这给患者带来了很大的负担。印度影星阿米尔汗曾经在一档节目中就讲述过印度医疗体系的问题。他指出，一些医生为了自己的收入，不顾情况为病人开各种昂贵的药物，这给患者带来了极大的负担，甚至导致家庭破产。印度政府也意识到了这个问题的严重性，并采取了一系列措施来解决。那政府已经加大了对医疗体系的投入，提高了医生和护士的待遇和福利，同时也加强了对私立医院的监管，打击虚假宣传、不正当竞争等行为，以保证患者的权益和利益。既然这么差的免费医疗，到底是什么让印度人的预期寿命从不到三十三岁暴涨到现年的六十九岁了呢？答案是仿制药。印度的仿制药产业非常发达。作为全世界排行前列的仿制药大国，印度以三千家仿制药企业为核心，占据了全球五分之一的仿制药市场。印度仿制药产业之所以能够如此发达，与印度政府的政策支持密不可分。印度政府在政策上给予本土药企以各种方便之门，在专利原创上不遵循国际准则，允许药企不顾知识产权。仿冒欧美专利药物，这使得印度仿制药企业迅速发展壮大。仿制药是一种与原研药物具有相似活性成分、剂型、剂量和安全性的药品。由于仿制药价格相对便宜，许多印度人都选择购买印度仿制药来治疗疾病，这也使得印度仿制药在全球范围内广受欢迎。然而，仿制药产业也存在着一定的问题。首先，仿制药的质量和安全性是否与盐盐药物相当，还需要进一步的研究和验证。其次，仿制药产业的发展也受到一定的批评，因为仿制药企业不顾知识产权而进行仿冒，这种行为有博于国际知识产权的保护准则，并且可能会导致研发创新能力的下降。最后，仿制药在一定程度上也影响了原研药物的市场份额，这可能会导致原研药物研发资金和资源的减少，从而影响了新药的研发和推广。因此，印度仿制药产业需要更加规范和可持续的发展。
，印度政府可以加强对仿制药产业的监管，确保其质量和安全性，同时也需要更好的保护原研药物的知识产权，鼓励创新和研发。同时，印度政府也可以加强与其他国家和国际组织的合作，分享医学技术和知识，促进全球医疗卫生的发展和提高。总的来说，印度的仿制药产业在一定程度上解决了印度人民的医疗需求，但是同时也面临着一些问题和挑战。谢谢大家，这就是本期亚洲大眼睛。希望听到您的意见，留言在节目下方。我想跟大家谈谈几个问题啊。第一个，大家经常这个提到中国可不可以做世界领袖？那么，观众朋友大家好，欢迎收看今天的新闻分析。在美国亚利桑那州凤凰城北郊的沙漠中，习近平总书记经常说，他要建立足球场的大小，还有领导从三十公里外的公路上就可以看到一片巨大的建筑群和周围的巨型起重机。这里就是台积电在美国新工厂的所在地。台积电的一位美国工程师说：“建造如此巨大的工厂，而且全部采用尖端技术，这种情况很罕见。”台积电掌握着当今世界最先进的芯片生产技术，控制着全球最先进定制芯片百分之九十的市场。但是，《金融时报》报道，台积电斥资四百亿美元在亚利桑那州建造两座芯片工厂的项目，现在却被。公司带来了巨大的文化冲击，是台积电在美国严重水土不服。到目前为止，台积电仅在台湾的大型工厂生产最先进的芯片。如果有任何问题，当地的研发人员就会立即介入解决。供应商也紧密地围绕在台积电、台湾工厂的周围。数十年来，一直参与台积电发展的供应商，可以对它的每一个新想法迅速地做出反应。正是这种运转良好的模式，帮助台积电。大多数，所以说东方和西方在中国这个一个专制的国家，他想当领袖的这个越来越担心中国对台湾的攻击，可能导致世界失去芯片供应。那么还有一个就是，呃，我们经常讲，分散它的工厂足迹。就说这个除了亚利桑那州之外，台积电还在日本建立了一家新工厂，并且承诺在德国也会建立一座价值一百亿欧元的合资工厂。台积电的董事长刘德英在九月份表示，就是、亚利桑那州是海外大型基地开发的第一个试验。而这项试验是否能成功，呃、可能将决定美国试图恢复半导体本土生产的努力但这个这个在南北这个拜登的这一努力包括着价值三百九十亿美元的芯片工厂补贴，这是二战以来美国最大的产业政策的一部分。加利桑那州项目还可能决定着台积电。能否转型成为真正的跨国公司？还有巴西、像南非，呃，这些国家。美国芯片行业的研究分析师表示，这家台湾公司一直在与美国的建筑方式和劳动力方式做斗争。像印度这些国家，它是这个有长期的。今年七月份，刘德英告诉投资者，美国工厂的投产日期将从明年推迟到二零二五年。而对于亚利桑那州工厂将发展到多大？台积电开始模棱两可，台积电已经获得足够的土地，并进行四个阶段的扩建。但是台积电供应商的几位高管现在表示，他们不相信台积电会扩建完所有的阶段。那么，台积电迄今为止宣布的两家芯片工厂，将使其每月产能达到六万吨芯片。那么，中国这个成为一个中等规模的工厂，但是会远小于台积电在台湾运营的每月生产超过十万片芯片的超级工厂。美国商务部长雷蒙多的前高级顾问表示，亚利桑那州现在存在很多不确定性和紧张因素。现在是民主国家，还是中国这个国家？现在是民主国家，还是中国这个国家？现在是民主国家，还是中国这个国家？现在是民主国家，还是中国这个国家？现在是民主国家，还是中国这个国家？现在是民主国家，还是中国这个国家？现在是民主国家，还是中国这个国家？现在是民主国家，还是中国这个国家？现在是民主国家，还是中国这个国家？现在是民主国家，还是中国这个国家？现在是民主国家，还是中国这个国家？现在是民主国家，还是中国这个国家？导致施工延误。台积电的一家供应商表示，台积电习惯于自上而下的方式处理一切事情。在台湾，承包商习惯于服从台积电的命令，并且适应快速变化的指令。但是在美国就会出现沟通不畅的情况。另外，美国在最先进芯片的机器方面也缺乏足够的人才。最近，台积电一直在试图寻找足够的熟练技术人员来安装最先进的机器。
最终六月份，台积电不得不从台湾增派了五百名专家来到美国提供帮助。一位从台湾前来美国的内部员工表示。他来这里是为了帮助安装除此外，反财产权，也就是反生产资料私有制的制度性的和结构性的制品上。这种设备是由荷兰公司阿斯麦生产的。由于在现在的中国，制造全球对这个非常不满意。一些行业专家表示，这个美国在 EUV 方面的专业知识确实较少。除了英特尔位于俄勒冈州的技术开发中心之外，美国工厂从来没有安装过 EUV。亚利桑那州的建设业务会让台积电的供应链变得更加复杂。台积电一直依赖台湾总部的许多供应商。业内人士表示，他们在台湾拥有非常强大的生产系统，包括围绕着台积电的供应链。台积电一直依赖台湾总部的许多供应商。业内人士表示，他们在台湾拥有非常强大的生产系统，包括围绕着台积电的。加工车间，一些大宗化学品供应商迁入和迁出服务商等等。但是这些其中很多都是一些小公司，他们不太可能跟随着台积电搬来美国。而有几家台积电的台湾化学品供应商的确来到凤凰城购买了土地，打算建造配套的工厂和仓库。但是对于他们来说，投入成本巨大。一家为台积电生产清洁化学品的公司负责人表示，台积电在美国的建设成本比在台湾高出几倍。现在好像也不太同样的，我们也是这样。北韩现在跟俄国好像更近一些。是在台湾的五倍之多。当然，而除此之外，台积电面临的真正难题将是如何向台湾工厂一样高效的运营美国的新工厂。所以伊朗国家报纸高管出了一个头条，说这个伊朗那边支持台湾独立，那中共家就慌了。所以说中共呢，他也是制服。这位高管还说，台积电可以在美国复制台湾已经量产的新工厂。但是没有信心使用并进采开发的新技术，在亚利桑那州生产。那么中共的价值模式，核心价值模式就是四个坚持：坚持这个坚持这个新的工厂主义，都能够迅速提高良品率的能力上。而这是通过授权工程师在工厂进行实验实现的。这与其他一些芯片制造商的做法形成了鲜明对比。它的经济模式实际上也是没有吸引力的，因为中国的经济模式就是完全非经济的计划经济。也就是每个新工厂都必须按照公司技术研发中心的，因为中共没有一个文化主体，一方面他想向全世界兜售孔夫子之类的传统文化，但是中国文化的主体是以传统文化为敌的共产主义教条，然而在台积电，社会主义精神文明却毫无中国传统文化的精神。这就是他们实现一份从未有过的效益的原因。分析师认为，台积电自己的这种模式是他制成技术寿命远超竞争对手的主要原因。然而，台积电的做法在很大程度上依赖于拥有研发新兴技术的研发团队，并且他们要在距离工厂一小时的车程范围内就能赶到。而亚利桑那州和台积电总部之间的执行时间为二十小时。这个呃，西方呢，当然也给钱，但是西方这给这些欠发达的国家的钱呢，它是有条件的，它是要在企图在这。国家呢，从制度上、从根本上更加民主化、更加市场化。那么中共呢，他给钱呢，他不讲这些条件，他主要是把这些钱呢给这些国家的精英在另一端来搞统战问题。实际上呢，这个当时这些国家的老百姓发现了这些这个中国的统战技巧之后呢，在跟这些国家造成严重的政治不稳定，往往成为这个呃这个对华政策呢，往往成为这个这些国家的这个选举的一个主题。而这在美国却做不到。所以说，从真正意义上来讲，我觉得中共在亚非拉的地方也没有真正的。但是在美国。如果是工程专业的毕业生，那么他们会想去苹果或者脸书工作，而不会想来到工厂。在凤凰城这个问题显而易见。台积电计划在两座芯片厂投产后，雇佣四千五百名工程师，而且还要在台湾设立新工厂。两座芯片厂投产后，雇佣四千五百名工程师，而且还要在台湾设立新工厂。两座芯片厂投产后，雇佣四千五百名工程师，而且还要在台湾设立新工厂。两座芯片厂投产后，雇佣四千五百名工程师，而且还要在台湾设立新工厂。两座芯片厂投产后，雇佣四千五百名工程师，而且还要在台湾设立新工厂。两座芯片厂投产后，雇佣四千五百名工程师，而且还要在台湾设立新工厂。两座芯片厂投产后，雇佣四千五百名工程师，而且还要在台湾设立新工厂。的大学生表示，明年完成硕士学位后会考虑在台积电工作岗位，梦想与现实之间的。但是听说台积电工作时间长，而且很难请假。他称这是亚洲企业文化的一个特征。大学生表示，如果台积电想在这里有吸引力，就需要更多的向英特尔学习。那么还有不少朋友来问到，那么究竟美国和中国现在是不是进入了一种新的冷战？因为彼此的文化更加接近。那么这个问题呢，经常有人问啊。已经意识到这些深层次的差异。对，之前是透露，过去十二个月中，已经约有六千名台积电员工接受了跨文化培训。分析师表示，台积电自身的声誉之后，需要培养一支稳定可持续的当地劳动力队伍，不能永远依赖台湾人来经营美国工厂。进行了一种长达几十年的冷战。台湾人来经营美国工厂。而即使台积电在亚利桑那州的试验成功。
由于公司那么我想这个，从这个旧的冷战上，我们可以讲一个冷战呢，它需要有三种基本的这个内涵。第一个呢，它一定要有一种互相对抗的军工之后，意识形态。台湾以外生产的总销售额不太可能占台积电总收入的百分之十以上。第三个呢，它有这样一套同盟系统。但是美国观察人表示，这至少是重建。从这个地方几个结构来讲呢，那么我就讲这个，中国商务部的前顾问称，它实际上的意识形态是非常对立的。中共跟美国搞了几十年的这个这个接触，接触了半天，那么美国和美国的绝大部分的世界上的盟友都意识到。华尔街日报报道，中芯国际去年从美国半导体设计公司手中获得了创纪录的十五亿美元的收入，占其总销售额的五分之一。简单的技术转让不转让的问题。所以说呢，这个意识形态的连这个中共的历代的总书记啊，从毛泽东时候就讲起啊，江泽民、邓小平、胡锦涛、习近平，更是非常非常。他在发言时还说。我希望有一天我们能够看到中芯国际在美国建立一座芯片工厂。活动视频显示，他的言论赢得了人们的掌声。马克思列宁主义的意识形态的表达了感谢。他总觉得，社会主义事业是非常正义的事业。所以说呢，这国际资本主义呢，要用各种各样的这个方式来对这个社会主义的这个中国进行扼杀。尽管被列入商务部的黑名中芯国际在美国半导体行业仍然发挥着不可忽视那么，所以说呢，在这个意识形态的冲突方面呢，绝对是有冷战的这个味道在里面。第二点呢，就是中共和美国呢，实际上它有很多方面。它有互相摧毁的能力。中共也是个核有影响力的鹰派国会议员认为，中国有很多新的武器，啊，美国也不能轻视。所以说，在美国和中国之间的对抗方面，这个能力呢也是非常这个令人瞩目的。大家不要掉以轻心。所以从这方面来讲，我觉得美国和中国呢，拜登政府则反驳称，这些限制使中芯国际无法掌握最先进技术。第三点呢，这个美国有很多同盟，中共的这方面呢非常的落后，所以它只能。最近几周，华为发布了最新的智能手机，令美国感到震惊。因为行业分析师称，这款智能手机采用了中芯国际制造的先进芯片。从这几个方面来讲，我觉得中国和美国呢，它实际上是一种新的冷战。而这正是美国那么中方的突破。我要指出的是，这个新的中美之间的冷战和旧的美国和苏联之间的冷战有很很多不同的地方。的实体名单通常被称为黑名单。美苏的冷战，它是互相隔离的，它是隔空交战。它只是要求美中现在不一样，它是互相渗透。你中有我，我中有你，更加复杂。而事实上，美国商务部已经发出了许多许可证。它是一种这个、呃、互相依赖的这个关系。而且，中共的经济强大，技术进步也很快。对西方的精英司向中芯国际施展了大量的抓捕的行动。所以在中芯国际来自美国客户的收入，多年来一直在攀升，并且在去年创下历史新高。第二点呢，那么同样是自由和共产主义之争。那么旧的冷战和新的冷战呢？呃，它的表现方式不一样。旧的冷战，美苏之间这个冷战，通常是通过苏联的赤裸裸的军事征服和共产主义革命和意识形态的直接输出。现在政府狭隘的专注于保护最先进的芯片，因为现在你要直接去搞军事征服，你要直接去搞共产主义革命的输出，因为担心这个好像是不合时宜。中共他也意识到这一点，所以中共的新的冷战的基本的战略方针，它是建立在一种也表示。如果继续不断收紧限制，将会造成更大的地缘政治挑战。这是精英对中共政权的严重依赖，那么一个方式。然后呢，建立了这种这种依赖，这种 dependency 之后呢，再实行全球的垄断和由中共主导的所谓的 international， 也就是他们所说的人类命运共同体。所以我觉得这个还是不一样，方式不一样。最后一点，我要讲一讲，实际上呢，中共天天说别人有冷战意识，实际上中共是最有冷战意识的一个国家。他一天到晚就是讲帝国主义。忘我之心不死，到处是外国特务和间谍，在中国到处都有。现在在中国又宣宣起了全民抓间谍特务的一个新高潮，而且中共政权呢，深信国际上的颜色革命和和平演变。习近平今年三月份到莫斯科去和普京见面的时候，他们的声明中间最重要的一条就是要防止西方对这些国家的所谓的颜色革命和和平演变。那么，习近平和拜登总统谈话的重中之重，就是要美国保证这个美国
，不在中国搞和平演变，搞政权更替，这是他每天想的都是这些东西。中共呢，实际上是每时每刻都生活在冷战的浓厚气氛之中。正是由此，中共戴上了冷战色色彩的有色眼镜，来看待世间的一切事物。任何的国际批评，他都说这是国际社会对中共有冷战意识，国际社会。对中共天安门大屠杀的谴责，对中共屠杀异议人士和少数民族人士，呃，反对中共偷窃经济技术和军事机密，甚至连中共的间谍间谍气球在美国领土被打下来，他也说这是美国的所谓的冷战意识在作怪。当然，这些都是托词了，完全是中共井底观天，以冷战之心夺君子之福，贼喊捉贼。但是呢，也不能说中共托词没有任何变化，他有很多话谎话不能支援的时候呢，他也不得不改口，避免丢面子。你比如说，中共在八十年代、九十年代，甚至甚至二十一世纪初期的头十年，他经常讲，呃，中国政府必须要这个坚持所谓的生存权，也就是说，现在发展经济，经济发达了，全跟人民脱贫了，那么。这这个时候呢，才能搞这个呃民主啊、自由、人权这些事情。这个中共他政府他不敢说了，你听你很少听到中国政府政府领导人现在在说这种话，为什么呢？因为习近平他说，在他的英明领导之下，全中国已经脱贫了，中国已经富强了，中国人民惹不起了。那么在这种情况下，那么民主、自由、人权是不是可以实现了？所以说这个是一个弥天大谎，他的谎言不能圆起来了，所以他现在不讲了。那么还有一个啊、呃，你比如说中国政府，这个在五六年之前，他经常讲，呃，美国对中国的什么批评，呃，中国人民绝对不答应，这是伤害了中国人民的这个这个这个呃呃心啊，这个现在也不怎么说了，因为呃，这个吹来吹去呢，老百姓不同意了，呃，你不可能说一方面说我们全面脱贫了，现在我们这个这个人权、民主、自由应该缓刑。啊，还有一个，你不能说这个中共现在这个全面脱贫了，但是中国的总理李克强说，这个中国百分之四十的人口生活在每个月一千元人民币的这种水平之上，那个是很贫困的一个一个呃一个数字。那么李克强总理说了这个数字之后呢，中国的国家统计局马上向新华社、向人民日报提供准确的这个支持的数据，说哎，李克强总理讲的这话是对的。所以说，在欺骗和狡辩上呢，中共是手段多端，左右逢源，十分老练。那么说到中共国际上应对手段的与时俱进方面，那么我们最后再讲一讲这个正在进行的杭州亚运会。实际上，这个杭州亚运会啊，这是不折不扣的劳民伤财的面子工程。据各方面统计，中共在这个筹办亚运会方面，总共花了高达三千亿美元的巨款。中共想把这个。亚运会办成展示自己国际领袖能力、给世界指明方向的盛会。他开始的时候呢，胃口很大，请了各方人马来捧场，包括一些根本就不是亚洲的国家，比如说俄罗斯和白俄罗斯、新西兰和澳大利亚。这本来就是违背了运动会的职业精神和职业道德，因为体育运动并不是政治运动，更不是大外宣的逢场作戏，所以遭到很多人的抵制。新西兰、澳大利亚在第一时间就说：“哦，不去了，啊，没有兴趣。”而邀请俄罗斯和白俄罗斯来参加运动会，更是违背了运动的精神，所以遭到了十几个亚洲国家的抵制。一下子看来，好像这个社会办不下去了，所以中共呢，要与时俱进，改弦更张，十分丢面子的撤回了对俄罗斯和白罗俄罗斯的邀请，这样才勉勉强强拉开了序幕，开始了这场盛会。但是，真正去到中国给习近平捧场的国家元首，实际上是寥寥无几，就那么十几号人，没有任何一位举足轻重的亚洲国家领袖出席。在这个杭州亚运会，最尊贵的领袖就是中共的反美英雄——叙利亚的独裁者阿萨德。你原来，中共在亚洲很铁的盟友巴基斯坦和北朝鲜也没有派最高国家领袖去捧场。所以把政治运把这个，所以把体育运动政治化，实际上是很不得人心的。但是呢，中国能够改弦更张，还是有一点与时俱进的进步，这一点值得表扬。